Well, good morning. Uh, this is the North Yorkshire County Council Scrutiny of Health Committee and the second live broadcast of the committee. It's being shown on the council's U YouTube site and will be recorded. Could I ask Daniel, please, to let us know of any apologies? Yes, Chairman, thank you. So the apologies that I've received are from County Councillor Philip Barrett and Scarborough Borough Councillor Sue Tucker. And we have Scarborough Borough Councillor Jane Mortimer subbing for her today. Thanks very much. You're very welcome, Jane. Um, so turning to the minutes of the, the last meeting, which was on the 11th of September. If anybody wants to raise, I think we'll, we'll take this fairly informally. If, any, if anybody wants to um, uh, comment on anything uh, or, or challenge the accuracy of them, could they please um, make make that known? Um, I'll just give a moment for that for anyone to uh, to raise that if they want to. Um, I don't uh, think I see any but wanting to do so, so I will declare the, the minutes uh, adopted. OK, thank, thank you very much. We move on to declarations of interest. Does any member of the committee need to declare an interest? No. No, no declarations of interest. If um, if 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 we come to uh, if we come to an item where it, you 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 feel that uh, you have an interest to declare, despite having not done so, now please don't uh, hesitate to do so. Sorry, chair, I did put my hand up. If that's okay. Oh, yeah. Is that Liz? Yeah. Hi, yes. um, Councillor Colin from Scarborough. It's not clearly it's not a pecuniary interest, but since I might want to speak rather a lot um, on the Scarborough <laughs> matter, I thought I should declare that I am a resident of Scarborough, a service user of the hospital and immediate past experience during lockdown with family for some of the services we're going to talk about. Thank you. OK, Liz, better safe than sorry. Thank, thanks for that declaration. OK, um, so we move on, I think, to public questions uh, or statements. Uh, Daniel. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, so I'm, we sorry. Have... I'm sorry, I've, I've jumped ahead of myself. I've jumped ahead of myself. It's, cha it's Chairman's announcements. Thank you, pardon. Uh, and there's rather there's rather a, a bit to, to report here, so please, please bear with me. <coughs> I'll, I'll read out a few, a, few, a few items and then we'll have um, public questions. So closer working with the Council's area constituency committees. Uh, the Scrutiny Health Committee is working more closely with the Council's six area constituency committees, ACCs, uh, building on the work that the Skipton and Ripon ACC did in scrutinising the redevelopment of the Castleburg hospital site at Giggleswick. We've had a further referrals to local ACCs to ensure that local members are fully engaged. So these include Thirsk and Malton ACC, a project, project is being set up across health and social care at developing primary care and ancillary services in and around Easingworld. Uh, secondly, Richmond York's ACC are going to be grappling with the question of the development of the Catterick Health Campus. <coughs> and thirdly, the, the Scarborough and Whitby ACC is also taking an active role in reviewing proposed and actual changes to services and also the development of the existing hospital site. A few points from the mid-cycle briefing meeting to report back. Um, the mid-cycle briefing meeting, mid-cycle briefing meeting on the 21st of October reviewed seven items um, and the, the aim was to consider how the committee could best be engaged. Firstly, Airedale Hospital, uh, a presentation was given on the structural problems with the existing Airedale Hospital and the proposed new build on the existing site. And a letter has subsequently been sent to the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care and to local MPs about this. And um, Daniel will circulate a copy of that letter af after this meeting, I understand. Thank you, Daniel. Secondly, Easing World, um, a verbal update was given on the progress with the project to review the provision of primary care services in and around Easing World. And as I say, the Thirsk and Moulton ACC will be engaging with that. Uh, Harra, the Harrogate and Rural Area. Um, 
I'm not sure. I don't think I've got that right. Harrogate and Rural Alliance, sorry, and the development of the Catholic Health Campus. We had updates on those as well. We had an update on an urgent care service review in York. Um, I proposed a um, review of the way that NHS Vale of York Clinical Commissioning Group provides urgent care across its patch was, was outlined to us. We looked at changes to Public Health England, uh, a verbal update on that and how this may impact on uh, local authority, public health and its role. And finally, um, Scarborough Hospital, a discussion on concerns which had been raised about the quality of care for patients at Scarborough Hospital. We were following up some specific leads there. And um, of course, that followed the Care Quality Commission inspection of the hospital in January 2020, in which um, there was a requires, requires improvement judgment. OK, well, that, that was from the mid-cycle briefing. <coughs> We've got um, another matter where I, I think there may just be, be a little bit of discussion, uh, and that's integrating, that's a paper which has been issued by NHS England and NHS Improvement called Integrating Care, Next Steps to Building Strong and Effective Integrated Care Systems Across England. Um, Organisations working in the integrated care systems, ICSs and partnerships, have been invited to respond to proposals in this paper with a consultation closing on the 8th of January. The, the options are, um, the paper looks at options for giving ICS as a firmer footing in legislation likely to take effect from April 2022, subject to parliamentary approval. It would include devolution of more functions and resources from national and regional levels to local systems to develop effective models for joined up working at a, at a place, so-called place level. And there'd be a triple aim to duty for all NHS providers to, if you like, collaborate uh, more. Um, and, and there are two, two options, um, statutory options involving, um, in, involving either a statutory committee model or a statutory corporate model. Now, the committee is going to be um, putting in some sort of response to that. It will be necessarily quite a um quite a general one i think because the time scale is short so i just wanted to be sure that um you were cited on that and now i know um councillor councillor jim clark has probably got some views on on this and i'd very much like to hear those because of his long experience in these matters so i don't know whether jim is there and would like to to comment are you there, Jim? Yes, I'm. I'm very pleased that we are. The council is putting in a response. I, I, I hadn't realised that, but I think it has to be indigenous say, by the eighth of January. I, I, I just wanted a, a rough idea because this is going to lead to legislation, and we haven't had any legislation. We haven't had a major health act since uh, 2012, and. Uh, in some ways, we're 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 still uh, having to work with the uh, uh, the 1990 Act, which which I was involved in another way very many years. You know, that's 30 years ago. Uh, but I'm I'm very concerned about North Yorkshire because we don't fit in to the natural. Pattern. And I know some members who have been on the committee a long time will will know, you know, at the moment uh, there's supposed to be the, the idea is there'll be an integrated care uh, system for uh, for each part of the of the NHS. And most of North Yorkshire is in Humber Coast and Vale, which is uh, based in Hull. Uh, the one part of North Yorkshire that is not in that integrated care system is Craven, which is in uh, West Yorkshire. And I think people know my views that I, I would have preferred to be in West Yorkshire, but but it, it does cause us major problems. And, and, and I think I welcome this in principle because the, the, the idea has been espoused that we should everything should go through the integrated care system 
and there should be one uh, CCG for the whole uh, of of the area. Now the area we are in is is well, it's it's the largest area of of any areas because it's uh, as I said to somebody the other day, uh, what does Hawes, and I remember my late friend John Blackie, who was on this committee for a long time. What does Hawes have in common with Hull? And uh, I, I said rather jokingly, the only thing I can think of is that they both begin with a with an H. But but in fact, uh, some members will uh, will will remember uh, a time when uh, we we went back to the. Uh, what was it? The uh, PCT, and at that time the PCT was led by a, 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 a North Yorkshire person called Chris Long, and I gather <coughs> Chris Long now has a major part in Humber Coast and Vale. So, so in fact, that that might be good news for us because I think he went to Hull. Yeah. hospital at, at, at one time but uh, the important the important thing i think this needs to be a major issue and a major issue for the county council and indeed anybody who takes over from the county council in the light of uh, devolution and uh, reorganization because the, this is going to be the fundamental building blocks and these will be statutory bodies and will have much greater powers than we uh, that they, they have at the moment. And when you look at places like uh, Greater Manchester, uh, you, you have Andy Burnham, who's the mayor of Greater Manchester and was a former Secretary of State for Health. They're powering ahead with with, with various changes and will, and they're working closely with uh, West, uh, West Yorkshire. And uh, I know we, by, I sit, as you know, on the, on, on the committee of the scrutiny, <coughs> joint scrutiny committee. Uh, I'm, I'm there by invitation, but uh, Andy Soloway, who's a member of this committee and a county councillor, sits there by right because uh, Craven and the Craven CCG is in uh, West Yorkshire in, and Harrogate. And although Harrogate is no longer in West Yorkshire, I got the name kept or, or I campaigned for the name because it deals with acute services for for many people in the Harrogate area. You know, if, if I was taken ill and I needed acute care, I, I would probably be sent to uh, to Leeds. But, you know, we're, we're again concerned. I, I won't go on much longer, but, you know, we, we have to make sure that the people of North Yorkshire are looked after properly because we have a we have a hospital in in Harrogate Harrogate uh, and District Hospital which is actually one of the hospitals in Humber Coast and Vale and yet it does work jointly with uh, <laughs> West Yorkshire and I, and I wouldn't want anything to fall be be between the cracks so I think this is going to be a bigger uh, issue going forward. <laughs> But 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 I think we I'm um, I'm just worried that we're falling a bit behind, and that uh, because West Yorkshire are powering ahead, Manchester are powering ahead, and and people will will it'll be an afterthought because of course we were involved with the uh, integrated care system. Uh, Heather and I were involved with uh, the people up in Teesside and Northumberland and. Um, I, I really think this needs high level review, but I would very much like, I think we ought to see what the response had, has been to the, uh, the consultation that closes on the 8th of January. But I think we should get in that somewhere that we are concerned about the fact that we are now uh, likely to be uh, governed from either uh, Wilberforce House in Hull or uh, from Wakefield as far as North Yorkshire is concerned. I think that, that that is a problem, but I'll leave it there. But I'm very concerned. OK, Jim, thank, thank you very much. 
I know I know we've made a we've made a note of those of those points and we'll we'll ensure they're played into the response that we that we, we do make. Now I see I see Councillor Murhouse and Councillor Colling both have their hand up to comment. Heather. You're on mute, I think, Heather. <coughs> <coughs> Heather, I can't hear you. We can't hear you. Chairman, it's Daniel Harry. Can I um, suggest that I get one of my colleagues to provide some technical assistance to Councillor Morehouse? And if we uh, move yes. on to the next question. Yes, certainly. Yes. Um, did you did you catch that, Heather? Uh, help is on help is on its way. OK, we'll move on then to Liz Colling, C Councillor Colling, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I know the timescales are against us, but clearly there is the beginnings of a draft response from North Yorkshire County Council, um, presumably coming out of um, HAS and, and the people who are working across um, the health service. Can is it too tight for us to have a short meeting of interested parties from this committee to review that response? Um, I appreciate that would have to happen. Heather's nodding. I can't hear you, Heather, but I could see you nod. Um, that would have to happen clearly the first week back after New Year. But given the experience of Councillor Clark and Councillor Morehouse and the concerns that all of us have about remote management of services, it might be useful to try and slot that in if at all possible. I, I would certainly support that. Um, it will be tight, but uh, it's such an important issue for us and getting the geography right will make such a difference. So I don't know, Daniel, whether you think something uh, could be could be put in the diary for the first week of, of January. I imagine many of us will, will have some spare time then because there aren't too many meetings usually. Absolutely. I mean, fortunately, I think the closing date for the consultation is the Friday. I think right. most people will be available from the Monday after the Christmas yeah. break. So it does wow. give us some time. So after this meeting, what I can do is email out to the committee to see um, suggesting a couple of dates and see who's available um, and then take it from there. And by that point, again, I think we should have a fairly robust draft that could then be discussed by that working group. That would be great. That would be great. Thank you, Daniel. Heather, are you are you back with us? Are you able to, to say? No. It doesn't look like uh, Heather is with us. I'm afraid we're going to. I think I'm, I'm. I think we're going to have to to move on because there are obviously some technical problems in 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 Heather's link. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for that. That was that was Chairman's announcements and a bit of a, a longer discussion on integrated care systems and where that's all moving to. So we do move on now to public questions or or statements, and um, we have a question from. Councillor Councillor uh, Moore, Richard Moore from Scarborough Borough Council. Um, Councillor Moore, would you like to ask your question, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for introducing me. Yes, I am a Scarborough resident and um, also a Borough Councillor. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd like to talk to you today about the public papers item six, updates on services, <laughs> particularly focusing on stroke services as part of the East Coast Service Review, if I may. Um, since May of this year, direct transfer of all patients requiring acute stroke care to the hyperacute stroke units in either York or Hull has been in operation. Is it the ambulance crew who make this call? Are all crews in a position to ascertain that a patient presenting with signs and symptoms of stroke meet the same triage criteria as an A&E department? And if this is so, is it the case that the same crew are then dispatched directly to York or Hull? So how is it decided which hospital they are taken to and how long will this type of discussion take? And meanwhile, is the ambulance packed up waiting for a direction? Mm. The efficacy <laughs> of treatment in the golden hour is well documented in the stroke treatment community. Does the York Trust believe that there is a 45 minute travel time from Scarborough to York? And is there data to evidence this? The report says that there have been no significant clinical concerns reported, but has the plight of family and friends who may struggle to travel to see their loved ones been considered? Because these concerns are vitally important. I can raise this point because I have had personal experience 
My auntie Jean suffered a stroke in early February 2018. She was taken to York and was very poorly. I visited her when I could. Her brothers, her, her brothers visited her once and her son tried his best to visit regularly, but how difficult that was. Her lack of visitors over those four weeks was not for a lack of love. A life lived full of love, she did die alone. I have other examples of such, such pain, which I can forward to you should you wish to read them. There are also concerns that outpatient services could ultimately be affected too. When the last substantive stroke consultant left Scarborough in 2019, their replacement was made by bringing in a consultant out of retirement. If this mm. consultant would stop clinical practice, is it likely that these folks would be switched to York? After all, with no stroke ward at Scarborough Hospital, recruitment there could prove difficult. York residents appear to have it lucky. Even without York Teaching Hospital, there are major hospitals nearby and with dual carriageways providing fast access. But the coast isn't so lucky. I believe the East Coast should have its own centre of excellence stroke ward. If necessary, consultants should be asked to take the 45 minute daily commute. Although I can well imagine that any consultant may challenge their commute time allowance if it were to be a mere three quarters of one hour. The Stroke Association say it is important that reorganisation is undertaken in a clear and transparent way and that those affected by stroke are involved within the process. The majority of residents along the East Coast are unaware of these, of these potential changes. A recent survey places 91.8% of the Scarborough area public feeling there is not enough public information available about changes, developments in local hospitals. Finally, can anyone in attendance of this meeting answer the following question? Could you personally guarantee to transport, let's say, your mother from her home in, say, Scorby, just on the outside of Scarborough, to York District Hospital within the recommended time frame of ideally one hour at 5 p.m. on a bank holiday Monday afternoon? That's a slot that starts at the point where the healthcare incident began. Mm. And let's not forget this time frame slot must also include reasonable time for treatment. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Councillor Moore. Um, I, ju I just mentioned for the committee's benefit that we've also um, been circulating some documents by uh, from uh, Susan Richings and uh, John Wayne, both I think of, of, the, of the Scarborough area and concerning this issue more broadly. So I, I just mentioned that for, for the record. Um, well, we're, we're, we're fortunate to have with us Simon, Simon Cox from NHS North Yorkshire, Humber Coast and Vale. And um, I understand, Simon, that you're going to be in a position very kindly to, to reply to uh, Councillor Moore's uh, question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for, for the opportunity, Chair. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. OK, thank you. Um, so this this will pick up some of the uh, content of, of what my, my later items so uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll try to deal with with the whole stroke issue in, in one if that's okay and Councillor yeah. Moore's questions are, are actually really helpful in terms of uh, explaining that the changes Hang on two seconds <laughs> I think I heard I think I heard an animal noise sorry that's uh, uh, that's uh, sorted now um so I'll just I'll work through the points of, of Council Moore's questions um, in order, if that's OK, and, and just pick up some um, some broader points as well. So I'll try not to be uh, um, too long, but it, it say it does cover a lot of what I would have picked up in the in the stroke update later. So um, firstly, a, a little bit about the background of this. So um, as was discussed in, in a fair amount of detail back in 2015, um, and uh, Councillor Clark, who was then the chair of, of scrutiny, will uh, probably remember, um, the, the, the model which was introduced in 2015 of the um, assess and transfer model in Scarborough was brought about because of the inability to maintain uh, a wholly independent stroke service at Scarborough Hospital at the time. And that change was brought about um, in response to uh, consultant uh, retirements and the inability to recruit over a number of years to the consultant workforce in, in Scarborough Hospital. So that model was 
uh, patients who were suspected of having a stroke were brought to Scarborough Hospital, were, were met by a stroke nurse through the ED department, were then assessed and where they were um, confirmed as having a stroke or were thought weren't confirmed but were, were still um, questionable about whether they were stroke were then transferred to the hyperacute stroke unit at, Scarb at York Hospital. So for the past um, five years up into May this year uh, the majority of patients who uh, had a stroke or stroke-like symptoms were transferred to, to York uh, or in some cases Hull, but primarily those patients who arrived at York, at Scarborough Hospital uh, who did have a stroke were transferred to the hyperacute unit at York Hospital. So that process has been in place for um, about uh, five years, I say, up until May this year. Um, that was a, a, a process which was relatively unique in the UK. Uh, the majority of other smaller units that moved away from having um, their independent stroke units moved towards a direct transfer model, which was the recommended model by the national uh, stroke leads. Uh, the stroke lead at the time, Tony Rudd, was um, was happy that the, the Scarborough model uh, as implemented in 2015 was acceptable but his preferred model was uh, a direct transfer model and indeed that was the model that was introduced in North Allerton, um, in Airedale and in Harrogate. So up until this year the, the other parts of North Yorkshire, the smaller units that would have previously managed strokes on their own such as Airedale, Harrogate and the Friar Ridge um, all move towards direct transfer models into larger units. Um, so so the, the first point I think is in terms of the history of this, m many other units have gone through uh, similar changes to Scarborough. Um, Scarborough tried to maintain um, still admitting and assessing patients to, to uh, maintain access to Scarborough Hospital. Um, as of uh, earlier part of this year, maintaining an adequate level of medical supervision on the stroke unit in, in Scarborough became um, impossible and there was a concern in relation to maintaining the level of patient safety. So as has previously been discussed with, with scrutiny, uh, we moved to a direct admission model as of earlier, earlier this year. So that's a little bit about the history, uh, but that is the preferred national model. It's a model that's in place for many of the units. Um, the, uh, the national guidance in relation to hyperacute care is that those units see a minimum of 600 patients per year. So uh, Scarborough previously um, saw around 300 strokes per year. So somewhere between three and 400 people who would present with uh, stroke-like symptoms. Um, who would be in, in the ED, um, up to 600 people with potentially stroke-like symptoms, but the, the actual numbers of strokes was about 300. So half the number that would be recommended in terms of maintaining a, a centre of excellence for hyperacute stroke. So in terms of just working through uh, Councillor Moore's questions, um, mm. the ambulance crew who would respond to a 999 call assess the patient on agreed protocols. If there's any suspicion of stroke, they are now transported directly to the nearest hyperacute stroke unit, uh, and that is based on travel times. So for that um, portion of the population who would have previously accessed services in Scarborough, so for example in, in Bridlington or Driffield, they would go to Hull, and those patients who are in Scarborough itself or in the Rydale area will go to York. Uh, the smaller number of patients in the northern part of the area uh, around Whitby or from um, Ravenscar upwards would go up to James Cook, but uh, it works out at something like about 60-65% of patients would tend to go to York, uh, about 30% uh, or so would go to Hull and probably 5-10% to 10 would go to James Cook. Um, and um, so that was the first question in terms of the, 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 amb the ambulance crew uh, in terms of their, their assessment of patients and, and where they go to. Um, in terms of it, the, uh, uh, how, how it's decided which hospital they're going to, that is based on, on travel times. The only exception to that is where a hospital was in, in a sort of red alert, a red alert status where they had no beds or they were not accepting admissions, which is quite infrequent. But basically, patients will go to the nearest hyperacute stroke unit, uh, which the ambulance crew can take them to. Um, and 
that there isn't an ambulance which is is parked up ready to go in terms of stroke the ambulance crews will respond to any emergency uh, just like they do for heart attacks trauma any other emergency we, we don't have a particular crews for stroke or heart attacks the ambulances work very efficiently to deal with any medical emergencies that are are presented um, in terms of the, um, I'll try not to go into this in too much detail, although I'd be happy to discuss um, in more detail should um, uh, members wish to. In, in terms of the golden hour is a really interesting uh, subject because um, there isn't, uh, if, you, if you actually look through the medical literature, there's very little evidence around the golden hour as a generic concept around emergency care. The, the numbers of published papers that, that su support this is is practically zero. So the 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 concept is based on what we we, we can say and what the evidence the medical em evidence does say is that for emergencies um, prompt response and diagnosis is really important. And the most important thing is to go as quickly as possible to the most appropriate center and start the most appropriate care. Now, in some cases, for example, with heart attacks, the, the modern uh, method for many patients with heart attacks will be to go and have uh, an angioplasty at a major cardiac centre, so in Hall, Leeds or Sheffield. And the window of treatment for that is typically seen as about two hours. So if, for example, you were in Scorby in Scarborough, you, if you had the option of going 10 minutes down the road to Scarborough Hospital for your heart attack or an hour over an hour to Castle Hill, Castle Hill is the best option. You wouldn't probably get there in an hour, but if you get your angioplasty within two hours, that's likely to save more of your heart muscle than it would be if you went and had a more conservative form of treatment in Scarborough. Stroke care, um, and you know, again, we'd be happy to bring a stroke consultant to explain this in more detail. Um, one of the most important measures in terms of um, long-term survival and functional response to stroke is how quickly you get into a properly staffed, resourced hyperacute stroke unit. So the, the, the view of the stroke consultants is that ideally you should get within uh, get into a HAZU within, within five hours. Now, what we've seen since the change from May is that a much larger proportion of patients from Scarborough actually are now on a hyperacute stroke uh, unit within five hours than they were before. So those patients who went to Scarborough, went through the ED, perhaps had a delay in ED, were then assessed, scanned, then had to wait for an ambulance, then had a, a, an ambulance journey from Scarborough to York, and then had to, to wait from getting at York Hospital onto the hyperacute unit. Doing that within five hours is actually really difficult. What we've seen now since the change uh, is also that York Hospital have put in a change for a direct admission route. So all those strokes now, when they hit York Hospital, don't go through the emergency department system, which adds a delay. They are met by a stroke nurse and go directly onto the HAZU. And then for the vast majority of them, they'll, they will then go very quickly into a CT scan. So we believe that for Scarborough patients, that gives them uh, their access to CT scan is is about the same. Clearly, they are, they have to add in the journey to Scarborough time. Um, but um, it, in terms of how quickly they get into a CT scan, it's about the same. The, the speed that they get onto a HAZU and then are able to access high quality hyperacute stroke care is actually quicker now than it was in Scarborough because Scarborough can't maintain a full rotor of uh, consultants to support emergency care. There is now a, a seven man rotor in, in York, which is both stroke consultants and neurologists who are on call who can respond to that. Um, so we, we believe and the early evidence is that that is is the best model for patients in in Scarborough. Um, in response to your question about travel times, uh, I think that the, the, the the evidence that I've seen is that is 45 minutes is is not an accurate assessment. I think the the evidence that we did when we did the early part of the Scarborough review is for those patients in the Scarborough area who access Scarborough Hospital. The average of them accessing York Hospital and the transfer times is is 52 minutes. So it's slightly longer than 45. For many of them, they will make it within the hour. But clearly, there will be some patients who it. it 
um, that the transfer is smaller now. But for an ambulance, we anticipate the, the, the vast majority of them will be able to be transported to York within uh, an hour of an ambulance journey. And that is work that we've done with the ambulance service. Um, I, I do pick up the point about um, the, uh, the, the road network. And I think anything that elected members can do in terms of improving the, the transport from, from Scarborough to, to other units, I think would be uh, will be helpful. But the absence of a dual carriageway, unfortunately, is, is something that at this stage we can do relatively little about. Um, I think that one of the points I would make, and and it's, it's a very difficult one, I think is in relation to um, uh, family and carers uh, visiting their, their relatives. That is a really difficult problem, and I think it's one that we just have to try and find as many ways to be supportive of that as possible. We do feel in terms of the clinical care, um, then centralising some services in York, although it's relatively remote from York, from Scarborough, will provide better clinical outcomes. As I say, the evidence nationally is that hyperacute units should be seeing a minimum of about 600. Um, so we've seen those type of units close in, in Harrogate, in Scarborough, in Barnsley, in a whole range of smaller centres that aren't able to maintain high quality of care. Mm -hmm. But we are we do have to recognise that that is is a challenge for uh, members of the family who are visiting patients. And that is 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 really difficult. And uh, we just have to try and be as sympathetic as possible and try and if we can explore whatever opportunities we can for people to to visit. Um, I think in terms of your, your question about should uh, the people of Scarborough have a, a, a centre of excellence for stroke? Absolutely, they should. It's just based on the evidence and our ability to, to recruit doctors and, and to maintain a skilled workforce. The hyperacute element of that is something that it looks very difficult, if not impossible, to provide that within Scarborough Hospital at the moment. So as in a number of very specialised services that will involve transfer to, um, to to larger, more specialist units, as we're seeing across the country. And mm. although that feels like a reduction in access of services to Scarborough, um, one of my um, uh, tasks and objectives is to provide uh, the best quality clinical services and clinical outcomes. Um, and I, I do, uh, for what it's worth, I do speak as a, as a Scarborough resident and Certainly, if it was me, I'd rather go a, a larger journey at a longer time scale to the best unit to receive the best care than have something that's provided locally, which is is a lower standard. I do accept that for um, relatives and carers visiting patients, that that's that that is a challenge. But we our first duty is to provide the best clinical outcomes. Um, so uh, apologies for quite a long response, but I think it did cover a lot of the, the later discussions around stroke and I'll I'll pause there and take any further questions. Well, thank, thank you very much, Simon. Thank you for that. A very evidence based uh, re reply. Um, I, I think I ought first just to uh, check with Councillor Moore whether he has a, any, any supplementary to his earlier question and then we'll have a more general debate. Because we have, we have, sorry, just in terms of the management of the committee's agenda, we are, I think it does make sense to move to item six, which is the Scarborough Hospital one, and we will then come back to item five, the Healthy Child Programme. I think that'll, that'll bridge between the question from Councillor Moore and the more general discussion about Scarborough. So that's how I plan to, to run it with your, with your agreement. Councillor Moore, have you follow up? Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, and thank you, Simon, too. And Chair, if I'd you know happily, uh, I'd like to watch uh, uh, and watch the um, the discussion and the debate on item six, and then leave after that, if that's okay with everybody. Um, that's fine. Thank you. So, okay. well, totally with uh, Simon, we've got to both agree, and I think everybody can agree that this, there is an apparent reduction of services um, to Scarborough. And and it and it is being felt that is being felt by me and it's being offered to me as uh, as point of argument and and the point that um, you know it, it would be difficult to put a, a centre of excellence stroke unit in Scarborough it's more than disappointing I think that um, that even going on everything that you've said there 
I think that the, I think there's there's danger to it. I'm afraid that's that's obviously I'm not a clinician, but the, the potential of um, of time it takes to get patients away. Um, as I said, Bank Holiday Monday, I, I, you know, in summer it's going to take much more than the average 52 minutes. I'm afraid. Um, I, I'm very surprised also with regards to the, your point that there's little to no published data on the golden hour because um, I've, I've I've seen everywhere um information data and uh, and consultants who who push for that and they'll quote saying things along line along the lines of time saved is brain saved time lost is brain lost and that the golden hour is actually um a very significant factor just to finish i'm afraid it, it feels that i have to worry that the apparent lengthening of the golden hour seems to be a position which is 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 there to to suit policy rather than the other way around and that's that that's unfortunately how uh, how it how it looks to me as a member of the public on this but i i do thank you for your time thank you very much thank, thank you councillor moore okay we've, we've got a few committee members wishing to contribute he heather moorhouse hopefully now back councillor sure. moorhouse back with us chairman can i sorry it's daniel harry from democratic services yeah. can we um, under public questions, um, have, I, I suppose what I'm trying to emphasise is, have we now finished the public question and going into the agenda item about Scarborough, just for yes. the clarity for the members of the public? So the public question is now done and we're now into the main body of the discussions around the presentation that's previously been circulated. All right, thanks, Daniel. That was that was how I saw it. Yes. Thank, thank you, you Councillor Moore. Um, but you're, you're welcome to, to, to listen to the discussion, of course. OK, um, I've got Heather Moorhouse um, wanting to come in and I know Councillor Colling as well. So first, first, Councillor Moorhouse, Heather, if you're if you've reestablished your link. OK, it would seem not. I'll, I'll just um, pick up the question which she had in the in the chat column. Um, Heather was saying the, I think we'd all agree the response time is essential alongside the ability for the delivery of care en route. Um, does Simon Simon Cox have any statistics, um, I think, on response time, she means, for, for which we could have for perhaps for circulation to members of the committee? Uh, y yes, we do. I mean, I think what, what I would suggest, I think, in relation to um, uh, figures and data, and one of the things that I was going to pick up in terms of the, the stroke item, um, and which I think when we discussed at mid-cycle was to uh, bring back a more detailed report in uh, February. Um, as part of this change, and one of the things I didn't mention earlier, is that the, uh, the changes in relation to stroke are not uh, um, peculiar to Scarborough or indeed North Yorkshire. So as of um, a few years ago, uh, well, as of before 2000 and, um, 15 there were there were five hyperacute stroke units in Humber Coast and Vale so uh, there are now three um, and there are um, there isn't a hyperacute unit in Scarborough or indeed in Grimsby and um, there is a currently a review within uh, the uh, Humber Coast and Vale of uh, the hyperacute stroke services um, two of those meetings happened this week uh, the one with Hull on Monday and the one with York on Tuesday and that was uh, included analysis of, of data. And Deb Lowe, who is the national stroke lead, she's a stroke consultant from uh, the Wirral, uh, is visiting um, and discussing with the, the hospitals in relation to stroke services. And what we'd suggested was when we get the report from Deb, will be to bring that um, with also associated data to uh, scrutiny um, uh, at your convenience, but really, if, if there's a meeting in in February, uh, March time, which would uh, we we can provide more data in terms of things like access times through the ambulance, the the proportion of people who are accessing um, uh, the hyperacute unit, and also the recommendations and the views of of Deb Lowe, who's as I say the the national lead on on stroke care, um, who was on on tuesday very complimentary about the services provided um through through york and scarborough um so so that will be my suggestion in terms of the the data i think that that would be re really helpful now i'm gonna i'm gonna bring in councillor colling because i think liz has got a few points about data so off you go liz 
Thank you. I have so many questions, Simon. I'll, I'll confine myself to a clutch, if you like. Um, when we're talking about patients who ring for an ambulance um, prior to 2015, you said 600 um, presented with stroke-like symptoms an average a year, but 300 only had stroke. So first question, if you can, is, is now how many patients are directly transfer transferred to York and do patients with um, who are having TIA, are they screened out by the ambulance and do they go straight to Scarborough? Um, once people get to York, we had a, um, some information that said they would spend an average of 72 hours in York Hospital before they're discharged back to their home hosp um, hospital, in which case for us for Scarborough. Is that about right? Has that changed? Um, clearly, there, this is question three and four, I think. There's a Clearly, there's a national issue around stroke specialists and the recruitment of them. And it's a bit naive of us to think that in Scarborough, we could suddenly produce seven stroke specialists to man a hyperacute unit. But I just wanted a feel for what the national picture is about specialists. And I'm not sure we've got a full complement as it is at the hyperacute unit in York. And related to that, is there a whole raft of very specialised equipment in a hyperacute unit? Um, there must be some reason why we've gone down from five to three um, across the patch. And then you'd be pleased to know my final one, which I don't think you'd addressed when Councillor Richmore asked it, which mm. was um, after they've been seen in York, transferred to Scarborough and finally discharged, they get their outpatient care in Scarborough. How sustainable is that for us going forward? And that, I think, will be a good enough for now. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Can, uh, uh, are you OK if I work through those um, now? Yes, please, Simon. Yes, yeah. please. Um, so I think in terms of the, the, the numbers, as I say, we will do more detailed data uh, in the, the new year. But from um, since the change to November, um, there were um, of those transferred to York, um, there were um, 168 confirmed strokes. Um, 34 patients who were had transient ischemic attacks but weren't actual strokes and uh, 71 uh, which are uh, in a category called sometimes referred to as mimics so people who have stroke-like symptoms but on CT scan or further investigation so um, 273 I think that is um, of patients who were transferred to York. Um, I think in terms of your question with the, the, um, the ambulance service, the paramedics are able to ring and speak to um, the, the on-call st stroke consultant if they want advice. They, now, again, and what I, what I would want to say is that although I think the, the specific evidence in the medical literature around the, the golden hour is weak, Mm -hmm. Everybody does agree that the faster you get to the right place, the better it is. So I'm, I'm not actually suggesting that at all. Yes, um, time does mean brain. So the better you get to the right place, but it has to be the right place, not just any place. Um, but um, I think the so there, there is potential advice for paramedics. However, the general view, again, is is time's important. Therefore, the paramedics will take people to a unit unless that if there's any likelihood of stroke, then they will take them to unit. There may be odd exceptions. So, for example, somebody who is um, is is very obviously uh, palliative, or somebody who you know just really doesn't want to want any any further treatment. But um, generally, most of them, the, the large majority, should go to to a hazu, um, and that's the best ways to make sure. Because even patients who sometimes are, are query, they, they, the paramedics aren't sure whether they have a stroke or not. They're better taking them to a, a centre and having that ruled out. Um, in terms of the 72 hours, yes, um, the, the, the aim would be that they are repatriated to Scarborough as quickly as possible. We wouldn't expect people to stay in a in a HAZU typically for more than 72 hours. So for somewhere, <clears throat> depending on their condition, between 24 and 72 hours. Um, Again, we'll confirm in terms of the data, but the evidence seems to suggest that um, particularly for the younger, fitter strokes, quite a large people, a number of people can actually go directly home. So it, it may be that um, by effective quick treatment, a number of the people who come back to Scarborough don't go to Scarborough Hospital, they go directly home. And the other thing that we're working with uh, Humber Foundation Trust in, around the community services is to strengthen the access to um, home-based rehabilitation. So that the best and preferred model around um, 
stroke rehabilitation, particularly for the younger, fitter patients, um, is uh, what's called early supported discharge. So people having things like re um, physiotherapy in their own homes with support. Um, and um, in terms of the, the move to the smaller number of units, that's um, the, the two main drivers for that are the numbers of patients. So again, the experience is that it's not just an individual stroke doctor, but it's that the whole units that need to see a lot, a lot of volume of, of, of activity to get really good at it. And in specialist care where, where units, all of the people in it are, are seeing a lot of activity, they tend to get better at it. And strokes, one of those areas where it, it's not dependent on uh, an individual doctor. It's about a whole team of people. Um, there's increasing move to nurse consultants, much a, a really big input in stroke from, from physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language therapists for a number of patients. Um, and the other point I would make is that we will also probably over the next three to five years see um, a greater, well, probably earlier than that, if I'm honest, we will probably see a greater number of mm. patients in the Scarborough area needing to go to Hull uh, because one of the big developments in stroke care is what's called thrombectomy or clot retrieval, where um, radiologists can actually pull out clots from, from brains using lots of uh, clever modern uh, imaging um, so it might be some patients don't even need to go to, to York they go straight to Hull um, and in terms of the stroke specialists it is a national challenge around uh, around providing them and uh, I think one of the things that we need to do as an NHS is is train more doctors and and develop our stronger medical workforce and unfortunately that is something that has been uh, probably a weakness of the NHS for a number of years but it's not a, a stroke specialist problem is not something that's that's unique to, to Scarborough or York. Thank you Simon. I I'd like to just um, remind the committee that we're talking as well as, as stroke services we're talking about um, changes on, in oncology and in neurology so if there are any questions on that please Please prepare to ask them. Um, <clears throat> but I've got a couple of questions for Simon myself. Um, firstly, um, the, we, we've heard in the past about a, a transport and access group being set up as part of the East Coast Review, which would um, take into account the impact of those changes upon on the travel times <clears throat> for patients and carers. So I wonder if we could just be told a little bit more about that. And, and um, also a separate question, if you like, um, with services being transferred from your um, Sorry, with, with, with the transfers that we've, we've been hearing about today, are, are there any opportunities for services which are currently based in either York or Hull to, to move in the other direction, to fill the gaps in capacity left by um, less stroke work, for example, being, being done in Scarborough? Um, it's a really good question, I think, in terms of that, that, that last point. And that's one of the things that... Um, so, so I, I've uh, recently moved into a, 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 a new role that's that's uh, more dedicated or dedicated now towards uh, the, the East Coast uh, work and uh, around uh, the, the sustainability of of uh, services in Scarborough and particularly Scarborough Hospital. And that is one of the things that we are exploring is what services potentially could um, come to be more developed and centred in in Scarborough so you know at this stage I think we're exploring the options around um, whether we can do things like more more eye, eye type care um, and we're exploring about things like the the the, the further, further use of um, um, uh, facilities in, in places like Bridlington for other areas mm -hmm. so I think that is something that we'll be exploring um, as we move forward um, but I don't have any specific mm -hmm around that at this stage but um, I think the other point I'd make I think is that um, one of the um, potentially quite exciting developments um, in Scarborough is the uh, the capital investment around the emergency department so we're just in the process of completing the the first stage the, the outline business case stage around that uh, at the moment and um, we anticipate that that's a, a um, possibly more but certainly at least a 40 million pound capital development to provide a new ED at Scarborough and that may also give a little bit more uh, room and scope in terms of how we use the site there um, because uh, the Scarborough site has also been uh, physically constrained it's probably uh, it, in, in theory should have a greater bed base than it does so the, so that capital expansion will hopefully allow us to do more work in Scarborough. 
Right. And the transport and access group, Simon, is that uh, is that yes. uh, that's that that has met. I think that that, uh, that the, obviously the physical meeting of that has been constrained by by COVID. Um, so that has brought together a range of partners, and I think they're exploring what the the options are in terms of providing greater support to to patients. And I think linked to the to the carer. Um, and family support about how we can provide better support to to patients who need to to access um, work, um, need to access okay. services at, at, at the hospitals. In terms of patients themselves, there is already patient transport services in place, so that there should be less challenges in terms of patients accessing care. It's a bigger issue, I think, for for um, relatives. But again, we're also mindful at the moment visiting is much more restricted because of COVID than it than it was before. And one more for me, um, the, the proposed changes to the integrated care systems, do, do, do you think that will have an impact upon specialist services at, at, at Scarborough? Will it, for example, help deal with the workforce shortages, um, provide the opportunity for more specialised services to be to be maintained there? Um, it, it, it may do, yes. I mean, I, I think that's one of the things that um, we, again, I mean, Stroke's an interesting example where we are in the process of establishing a, a, a formal stroke network across uh, Humber Coast and Vale, so um, which is already working in shadow form. And that um, one of the things that we recognise that the that the whole uh, the York Scarborough and the the North Links and Gould service um, they all need to work together more closely, and they're already doing that to be honest. But we may move in in a few years towards more. Uh, shared rotors, greater uh, sharing of staff and support, which um, that has been one of the, the benefits of um, the York Scarborough merger is that that sharing of, of, of uh, staff across uh, across the trust. And I think the the integrated care changes may help to support that further. OK, well, I, d I don't see any further questions, so um, I think I'll just um, I'll just move to towards wrapping this item up. Um, just just on the stroke point, I think we should all remember. Chairman, that, uh, Chairman, Chairman yes. I've been indicating to speak for quite a while actually. It's Councillor Kevin. It's Councillor Kevin Hardesty. I've been trying. Oh, to sorry, to Kevin. I, I didn't see your hand raised. Apologies Please. for that. It's Councillor Kevin Hardesty from Hambleton District Council. Please I've, go ahead, Kevin. I've lived in North Allerton for fifty years, but I was originally born in Malton. And uh, I'm just a little bit disturbed. I appreciate the importance of getting the best service possible for the, for the patient. But when one talks about 45 minutes or 52 minutes traveling between Scarborough and York, it's not realistic. I mean, it's 23 miles from Malton to Scarborough and 18 from Malton to York. So that's a, that's a total of uh, 41 miles. The ambulance are going to have to have a hell of a speed to achieve getting to that journey. And I just think it's presenting the wrong image to the public. You're suggesting you can get from York to Scarborough in 52 minutes is just not reality. My, my in-laws lived in Rullington, and when you go between Malton and Scarborough, there are a string of villages there where you're puddling along at 20 miles an hour. I don't know where these figures have come from. It's presenting the wrong image for the public, I feel, Simon. I mean, I appreciate the importance of the best possible service for the, member, for the public. But I just feel it's not re realistic to talk of those figures. Mm. Uh, slightly, you know, and, and uh, I just... Welcome your comment on that. Give them the right time scales, please. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor uh, uh, May I'm happy to share the the analysis and the data that was done around that. That did involve uh, the the, the uh, Yorkshire Ambulance Service, uh, who are um, you know experts in travel times. Uh, what I did say, and I would repeat, is that the the, you know, the, the 52 minutes was was an average of the postcode to access Scarborough Hospital. I'm not saying that's necessarily. Um, every individual and it won't be every occurrence uh, as i say i think that what what we shouldn't do um is is maintain uh, substandard services in locations uh, merely because of travel times um and i think that um yeah that there is there there is examples um it's quite an old paper now but there's 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 a there was a study done in saskatchewan in canada <laughs> Which is 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 much bigger than North Yorkshire, um, and they um, closed down a number of smaller cardiac units, and uh, they did a study to look at whether this had impacted on the populations. What they found was the populations that were most uh, impacted by this were those that were furthest away from 
the, the biggest centres and had had their units closed. And those were the centres that saw the, 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 the biggest improvement in outcomes because there were patients who were managed in smaller units. You know, many of us remember, you know, I've worked, lived in Scarborough for 20 years. When I started, cut, heart attacks were still managed in Whitby and, and Moulton Hospital. And the, the modern method of specialist care is for particularly that very early phase is going to, to bigger specialist units. And we have to work. And one of the things I'm committed to is to maintain whatever services we can do in Scarborough Hospital. But we, we shouldn't maintain services which are substandard merely because they're local. And I'm not, not suggesting anyone saying that, but actually uh, sometimes it is a choice between the best care or local care. Can okay. I just come back, Chairman? I, Kevin. I, I fully appreciate what you've said, Simon, but I think in, in informing the public, I think that whoever's looking at the transport situation needs to be realistic. I mean, I say to, to travel between the time scales you're talking about from Scarborough to York, you'd be travelling at 100 miles an hour. It's not realistic. And I think I think the public need to be aware of that. It, mm. it gives, I mean, the principle of what you said, I totally support the best care in the best possible place. But it's just that when I saw those figures, I thought, I'm in a different world, you know, and I say, it takes me back to my grammar school geography as to knowing how long it is between, and nothing has changed in, in that mm. time, apart from the Malton bypass. The road hasn't changed one iota. I mean, what we what we can do and what I'll share in our fuller report is that is that because we have got times of how long it takes patients from uh, to actually get onto the, the uh, hyperacute unit at York. And based on the figures we've got, um, that is um, an average of about three and a half hours. So that's the point where they're identified as a stroke to the point they're on the best unit to receive care after having a CT scan. As I say, that compares with typically about five and a half hours when they were coming from, from Scarborough. So that's the critical bit really is, is that the, the stroke specialists are saying, get on a specialist unit and have active treatment within five hours. And we will uh, we'll do some data in terms of because uh, the travel times obviously will vary. What we want to know is is overall how quickly people get mm. their, their definitive assessment and diagnosis and their definitive start of their definitive treatment. And we believe the evidence is that that is actually now better than it was in under the previous model. I think it would be really helpful if, if your report in February could include some statistics along those lines, uh, yeah. Simon. Thanks very much. OK, I'm going to just take two more comments uh, or questions. I've got Councillor Mortimer and Councillor Colling, and then I think we're going to have to wrap this one up. Right, Jane. Um, thank you. I'm um, going on to the oncology service, if I can. Um, yeah, um, by all means. Uh, where I live, which is at Filingthorpe, which is the north of Ravenscar, we will go to James Cook, which again is difficult travel. You're talking three quarters of an hour if you're lucky, but it is a good service when you get there. Um, it's Castle Hill. I have read this quite happily, if I can say that the service you get at Castle Hill for oncology and uh, tumours. My father went there uh, when he had the, his problems. It's a number of years ago. And the service he got there and the treatment he got there was absolutely superb. But it's not that it's how as family you, access to Castle Hill is very, very difficult if somebody's there and you want to go and see and they've had a major operation you're there for for at least a week 10 days maybe trying to travel every day and that is a nightmare especially in winter time i don't know what you can do about it or how it can be sorted out but having family there does help the patients and um, is there something that can be done uh, or helped with transport to get people there I don't know. The service when you get there is good and you can still now get your chemotherapy. I'd probably have to go up to James Cook. But in my father's day, everybody who had the sort of cancer he had went down to um, Castle Hill. Um, I mean, that's that's one of the things that we, we've asked the transport group to look at is is what potential solutions there are for, for visitors. Because that, that, as I say, that that is that, that is a challenge for us, I think, in terms of patients accessing care. Um, the, the on, just to briefly pick up the oncology service, there is um, a, another uh, ICS review of that because, again, I think that has impacted on changes to the South Bank as well. Um, one of the 
potential benefits uh, of um, COVID has been it has uh, forced um, or encouraged, I should say, a lot of uh, medical services to use technology more. So I think uh, the number of patients who have actually been disadvantaged about having to go to Castle Hill rather than Scarborough is, is, is less than it might have been because I think there's been greater use of, of video and phone consultation. Um, but we will explore um, the, the, the transport solutions for uh, for visitors, because uh, as I say, I think it is just a challenge, really. Thank you, Simon. Liz. Thank you. And um, related to what Councillor Mortimer was saying, but a bit tongue in cheek. So my understanding is um, after years of lobbying, the A64 is indeed due to be dual carriageway. Sadly, Simon, you make it sound like we should start lobbying now for something to happen between Scarborough and York. Uh, sorry, and Hull, so that we can get quicker to Castle Hill, because I couldn't agree more. You know, family in Castle Hill, it's a torturous journey to get there. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we are really stymied here on the East Coast with our lack of, of a, a, a robust road network. And don't even get me started on the Scarborough to Whitby link. So, but thank you very much for your time and frankness again, Simon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the, the other point I'd, I'd make just if um, was, one of the things that I'm I'm aware in terms of um, the the work is that we need to be as strong as possible in terms of the wider engagement. So if there are um, uh, councillors, particularly in in the Scarborough area, who want to be uh, part of, of any of the conversations around how services change, that will be really helpful. And we need to broaden the engagement. Uh, I'm you know fairly sensitive to the comments about. Um, a perception that people aren't involved and aren't consulted. The consultations won't always be what people want. You know, I'm, I'm honest enough to accept that, but we wouldn't want to be doing any of this in in any sort of uh, behind closed doors. We want to be open and transparent in terms of what we're doing uh, as we've been this morning. So if um, you know Councillor Moore or any others want to be involved in this process or further discussions, uh, I'm welcome to try and try and arrange that if that's helpful. That is helpful. I'm sure. Um, and we've spoken previously about the involvement of the um, North Yorkshire County Council Area Constituency Committee for, for the Scarborough area. So I think that will be that will be helpful as well as um, the Borough Council. So, so Simon, thank you very much for your um, presentation. It's been very detailed, very authoritative. And um, I think also it's good that we've been able to address some of the, the questions of evidence about clinical effectiveness, uh, which um, have been um, underlying some of the questions about speed of access and so on. I yeah. think, as far as I'm concerned, I, I would very much welcome um, a further discussion in February with more more, more data, um, yeah. particularly about access times, travel times, um, just more, a, more, a more substantial um, data-driven dis discussion. So yeah. I hope, uh, and, and indeed, if the Transport and Access Group is, is working on these matters, that would be something that could be perhaps fed, it, fed into it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, what so, we'll try and do also is a, perhaps a slightly more detailed paper, so we won't necessarily have to cover all of it in as much yeah. detail in the meeting, if that's helpful. I think that is helpful because we'll, 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 we'll have this uh, discussion at the back of our minds when we come to the more detailed discussion. Yeah, OK. OK, th thank you very much, Simon. Uh, I think you're free to go, uh, but you're very welcome also to, to stay. We're... Um, it looks as though we're moving on to the healthy, indeed we are moving on to the Healthy Child programme. Um, and um, the presentation is is um, being, has been loaded by, by Patrick, I think. Um, so this is um, item, this is item, item five on the agenda. Um, we've uh, got some or all of Richard, Richard Webb, the director of HAS, Mike Rudd, from HAS, Victoria Onanese, Public Health Consultant, uh, Louise Wallace, the uh, newly appointed Director of Public Health. Um, I'm just conscious that this is a this is a um, program, uh, a set of changes which is currently under public consultation. Um, it's one which has been to the committee before. So what I'm going to suggest to our our HAS colleagues is that. Um, and particularly with a view to the, the time that we've, it's now, it's now nearly quarter past 11, that rather than going through the presentation, they assume that um, we have all looked at it. Indeed, some of us, indeed all of us, will have had a presentation at the, our respective area 
uh, ACC, Area Constituency Committee. So I'd like to ask Has colleagues, um, uh, whom I can't actually see just at the moment, but I assume they're there. Could they just make a couple of general points and then we'll open it up for questions rather than going through the presentation, which I think we can assume that everybody has has already read. Right, thank you. Over to, to Richard, is it? it it's Louise, uh, Councillor Ennis. So, um, hello, hello, Louise. Everybody. <laughs> Hi. hello, Louise. Hello. Welcome. And thank congratulations you. on your recent appointment. Thank you. Yes, it's a, a massive privilege to take on the Director of Public Health role right now at this point in the pandemic, um, but looking forward to doing lots of good work with the committee as I hope um, we've done over previous years in my last role. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I will bring Victoria in because Victoria is our lead consultant in public health on this piece of work. But I just wanted to put into context really and remind the committee about this important development because it is about giving every child the best start in life, which I know you're familiar with, as we've talked about as part of the health and wellbeing strategy um, that we've got. And there is a focus on the early years, not to five, as well as older children. Um, and of course, the responsibility for ensuring um, school nursing health visiting, that not to 19 offer, came to the local authority with public health duties um, several years ago. And this is an opportunity to think how we might do things differently and embed this service as part of the integrated early health and wellbeing offer alongside our CYPS services and other services that are there in the NHS and the wider partnership. So um, I might just hand to Victoria if I can, Chairman, just so Victoria might want to add any comments to what I've just said. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Uh, hi, um, good morning, Chair, and everyone is Victoria on another public health consultant. Uh, just, morning. just, just to say that uh, the Healthy Child program is, is part of the wider services that we provide for children, young people, and their families in North Yorkshire. <clears throat> so it should be seen within that context and the mm -hmm. purposes that you uh, that are being consulted on. Uh, uh, fitting in, in in that wider system, and we are working as as part with part local partners to ensure that uh, we identify the needs in the area and able to meet the needs uh, um, appropriately. So, mm -hmm. um, very much a consultation proposal. So, uh, mm -hmm. and I think Louise has said it. So, we are trying to make the best of what we have. Uh, in terms of ma making sure that the services and the service model we have in place actually meet the needs of the local population. And um, mm. uh, I will welcome your views on, on, on the proposal and on, on the presentation. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you both for that admirably brief uh, introduction of the item. Thank, thank you. Uh, while people just quickly reflect whether they have any, any questions, could I I, I would just like to um, ask, um, really, if you could say a little bit more about um, the criteria that will be used, you'll be using to decide whether um, a client or a patient receives a face-to-face -face appointment as opposed to a, a remote appointment. Um, another, I, know, I appreciate that from the paper that families who are deemed at risk will have face-to-face, -face, but I think I got the impression that in over and above that, some others would receive face to face, but you'd be conducting some sort of risk assessment. Can you say a little more about that? So, yes. yeah. Sorry, Chair, we forgot to introduce our colleague um, Susan Lam from the Harrogate and District Foundation, who's also with us. As you you oh. read from the presentation, this is a partnership proposal with uh, between North Yorkshire County Council and Harrogate District Foundation. So. We have the pleasure of having uh, Susan Lamb, the head nurse and safeguarding at uh, public health, um, public health lead and safeguarding nurse at the Harrogate and District Foundation. Susan. Yes, I'll take that question. So yes, I'm Suzanne Lam and I'm Head of Safeguarding and Lead Nurse with Harrogate and District Foundation Trust. You're absolutely right. What is being proposed is a blended model, which means that some families will receive virtual contacts, but the vast majority, we will a be, will be aiming to provide um, face to face contacts as the norm. So any family that's vulnerable, they will receive all their contacts virtually. 
I'm sorry, face to face. And the only contacts that will be done virtually are those families who are deemed after a robust risk assessment to be not at risk at all. But that would only be done if led by um, capacity. So if we had the capacity to do a home visit, that's what we would be doing. Um, we'll be aiming to do home visits as much as possible. The service is very much focused around the home visit and building up that relationship with families. It is only um, where capacity demands it. So say if we've got a lot of safeguarding or a lot of vulnerable families, then we would have to effectively target where to use our staffing resource. And it may be that in those cases, there would be a blended approach. To, but it's about making sure that the right family get the right contact by the right person in the right place. We are looking at more place-based activity. So this model will be very much about looking at place, delivering activities, delivering group activities in villages, in the places where people live, in the venues that people want them to be delivered in. So it is very much a focus on home visiting and a focus on delivering in local venues. Thank you very much for that. Daniel Harry from Democratic Services. I understand that Councillor John Ennis has temporarily lost the connection to the meeting. So um, can I ask Councillor Liz Colling as Vice Chairman whether you can continue chairing the meeting in his absence, please? I certainly can. Thank you for that, Victoria. Uh, Suzanne, sorry. Um, are there any questions from the committee around the paper? We have had a previous presentation about it. Um, I have a question for Louise then. Um, hi Louise and congratulations from me too. Nice Thank to be you. working with you with a different hat on. Um, so the consultation closes early in the new year and then it goes to the executive. Um, what happens in the gap between new year and the implementation of the new project um, in April? Are we realigning staff and what support have we got for staff and what redeployment of existing staff have we got in place? Thank you, Councillor Collins, and thank you for your good wishes there. Um, it's probably one that's best answered by Suzanne, because as I think Victoria said, this is absolutely a partnership between ourselves and HDFT. But of course, Suzanne is the leader that delivers the service, so it's probably best if Suzanne answers that. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, you're, the consultation ends on the 6th, 7th of January. From the 7th of January, we'll be, we will be working on our new workforce structure and new workforce model in line with the the, the consultation and what's come out of that. Um, that is the work. The mobilisation of that will happen in between um, January and the 1st of April. So in February, we will go into a consultation with our staff. We are not looking at any forced redundancies in our frontline mm -hmm. staff. Um, there's a gradual reduction in this contract value, which will happen over three years. So that will be done as staff leave. We look at every vacancy. So we're not at this stage, we're not planning on any redundancies, but there will be a transformational phase um, in about the first six months, really, where we move towards the new model. Um, and obviously we have existing staff in place and those staff that maybe we require retraining into new roles, et cetera. So it will be about supporting those staff to take on the roles of the new model. Um, but very much about in January, it will be developing the workforce structure, February, the consultation with staff. Thank you very much. I believe Councillor Ennis might be back in the room, in which case I'll bow out. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, hello, Liz. I'm back. Yes, I'm not sure what happened there, but uh, I'm told that uh, Councillor Mortimer would like to ask a question. So if that's right, uh, please go ahead, Jane. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I am. I haven't seen the previous um, um, presentation because I, I'm a substitute for one of the members. Um, I found it a very interesting um, report when I, I've read it. Um, and I'm just wondering how, the, when do these changes take place? At the moment, you'll be working with families. Um, it is how you change that structure when you work with other families, with the families you've already got. With new families coming in, because there is that, um, there's always new families coming in that need care, not to fives and, and older children it's how you will continue or they uh, 
have a problem with a change of staff when they get used to one one a nurse going in or one person helping then with the development of uh, new staffing and methods uh, and training how will that affect the the uh, families um it'll be the same staff um we are we've got a staff workforce now um that deliver the service to this family these families um for not to five this is um we have mandated contacts um, that are, these are nationally mandated contacts. So in not a five, there isn't really much change in terms of how, you know, we, we had to deliver mandated contacts by health visitors. We still have to deliver those mandated contacts by health visitors because that's a national uh, requirement of the service. So if, many families will not tell any difference at all um, in the not to five arena um, because of the, um, they'll still to get the same health visitor coming in to see them as they always have. Um, for five to 19, and that is yeah, yeah, probably the school, yeah, the school nursing service. Um, over the last year, because we've we've obviously had to lose quite a number of staff already um, in preparation for taking on this new contract, we've actually started transitioning to the new model. So um, there's been, um, in 5 to 19, there's been a slow transition and focus on the vulnerable caseload already. So we are already transitioning to a disaggregated school nursing model, um, which has been in gradual stages over the course of 20 to 21. So for those young people, um, we will be appointing there will be nurses who are currently in interim positions because we've been in a consultation period, but those will be, they will become permanent positions and those will be the nurses that carry on delivering the service. There is a skill mix element to this proposed model, um, but we will still have school nurses, we'll still have health visitors, public health staff nurses, early years practitioners, um, and these are the people who are working with those families now. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Um, I, I've, I would like to ask... Um, sorry, uh, Chairman, sorry to interrupt. It's Daniel Harry from Democratic Services oh, yes. again. I, um, it, uh, I believe Heather Morehouse, Councillor Heather Morehouse has been waiting to ask a question. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So sorry just, that, can you hear me now? Am I there? Yes, we can. Good. Sorry, yeah, I did put on. Yeah, well, thank you very much. First of all, Louise, congratulations again. Tough time to take on the role, but I'm sure that you'll get there with all your expertise. And yet, uh, what John said earlier, yes, we've had this presentation at our area committees, and I'm probably going to reiterate what I said on the last time, but just because we didn't get, there wasn't all the information available. It'd be interesting to see how we're going to deliver, um, you know, the services, um, you know, locally. And I think it'd be a really good benefit because we're trying to engage with particularly my big issue is about young people teenagers often need help reluctant to engage with um you know at, at school probably a nurse and if we get out more into their local sort of like areas and i wondered if we'd managed to sort of look at the idea of maybe is it youth clubs things like that where we could discuss things like which whether you like it or not children or young people do have sex and the, you know and the, and the you know whether you like it or not they're not going to tell the parents but they might tell somebody else that they need some advice and i'm sure the schools are doing it to a degree but sometimes they need a little bit more than that engagement and to do with drugs i consider that to be one of the big issues that we need to be there for to sort of help people we know there's been incidents particularly you know in the northern part of the area where children have got engaged with drugs and it's a difficult thing. And again, going back to what Victoria said last time, engagement with the school is one of the things that we're looking at. But I'm not sure as a school governor, you know, as I made it my, I said at the last meeting, you know, it is a, a new big ask. And hopefully, you know, the governors need to be on board with this and I'm sure it will come about. But good luck with the project. But I'd be interested to know how it rolls out in the community and how you're going to engage with the younger members. These are the people that aren't in the system, if you like. That we need to sort of, you know, we really need to engage with. Thank you. Thank you, um, I mean, I'll take a part of that and then hand over to Victoria because this is very much about partnership working. And yeah. part of the um, work that we need to do moving forward is, well, there's two things really. One is that we will be developing within the disaggregated school nursing service, we will be developing a team that supports emotional health and resilience. 
And that's we found looking at the referrals into five to 19 service that the vast majority of those referrals that we receive into the service currently are around low level. This is pre CAMS, low level emotional health and resilience. Right. Much of that is about relationships. Um, so um, it may not be about um, actual um access and the sexual health services about talking about healthy relationships um, with 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 young people. So that is a part of our, uh, the work, work stream that we're going to be working on and developing in partnership with our local authority colleagues. The other thing I just want, and this is to do with the engagement of young people, part of our offer will be around developing the digital offer. So we currently um, are working on um, looking at apps, um, that using uh, QR codes on phones, um, texting services, all these kind of ways in which young people can engage with our teams. Um, and part of that is about service user engagement as well. So it is about developing the virtual offer for, for young people. That's not replacing face-to-face -face contact with those who need it, but those kind, those that kind of low-level offer where people just need to access really good quality and um, a database or a website that gives them advice or uh, chatting to, to a professional. So those are the kind of services that we will be developing with our partners. I'll just hand back to Victoria. Maybe she needs to talk about sexual health more. Uh, so in addition to what um, um, Suzanne has just uh, articulated, we are also working with our local CCGs, so not Yorkshire CCG, Bradford and Craven and Vale of York to develop a school-based uh, emotional well-being service, which will link up with what the school, what um, Susan has just described in terms of what the school nurses offer. So the idea is that we we ensure that we have a service that we can um, everyone can access and know how to access, both at early help and also in terms of specialists, uh, making sure that the people have access to specialist services like CAMS. So there is, there is, as part of the transformation for the program that we have, as, as Susan has said, we have a work program to ensure that young people, services for young people are linked up because often, as you mm. quite rightly said, uh, is young people knowing where to access these services and, and actually um, having the opportunity to, to access the services and the support that they need. So we are working as a system as part of this new service model to make sure that the services are joined up and also that we actually provide young people and families inf the right information in terms of how they can access services and access it in in a set in settings that they're actually uh, young people friendly because that's another thing because we commission sexual health services as well from York FT Foundation Trust and the idea is that we we'll work with them as well to ensure that where they deliver services from within the community settings and other areas are actually young people friendly and pe young people can feel confident in actually using the service. We are also working with pharmacies and GPs to make sure that they're also there outlets for young people to access services. So uh, as part of this, that's the exciting thing about this new service we are proposing, this model we are proposing is the opportunity to work across the system and transform the way we, we do things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Victoria. Is that okay, Heather? Yeah, fine, thank you. Okay. I don't know whether Car Caroline, Councillor Dickinson, as the executive member in this area, would, would, would have a comment. It's not compulsory, but... Uh, uh, Caroline, if you're there, would you like to comment? Hi, uh, good morning. I mean, we, we've heard a lot of, of detail this morning and I, I found this is a, a very interesting um, way of working. I mean, what we're doing is transforming the service to make it fit for the 21st century <coughs> and beyond. You know, during the pandemic, everyone's had to find different ways of working and the use of technology has given support to, to those in need. Um, you know, there's there's much available out there to to support children and young people as we guide them into into ad, adulthood. And I I hope that from the presentation that you realise that this is is the way forward in um, you know, and working on prevention rather than intervention uh, with with these children. Thank thank you, Caroline. Um, 
I think somebody else has got a question, or is that um, yes, Councillor Mann, John John Mann, I see. John. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to, first of all, say congratulations to Louise on the on the new appointment. I'm sure it'll be a, a challenging brief in the current uh, the current situation, but uh, good luck for the future. Um, just to say, I support the proposed changes. I think they'd be very well set out and presented, especially with the eight percent. I think it is reduction um, in the grant. Um, uh, my question is is related to. The advice given to uh, young parents, really, the uh, anti and to parents of young children, so the, the naught to five year old age group. I was just wondering, as well as advice on nutrition, which which is being given by the uh, health visitors, I was just wondering if any advice is being given on vital things like um, sleep, regular bedtimes, for example, um, also exercise. Um, that, that's very important to, as well, I, I'm guessing. Uh, not too much screen time, not too much TV time um, and, and things like that to, to try and help um, new parents. I was just wondering what advice was given on, on those two areas, please. Yes, yeah, so um, the health visitors when they deliver the mandated contacts that includes an antenatal contact and a primary visit which is the postnatal contact um, there's, there are there then three further contacts this um, part of these contacts is is around carrying out a family health needs assessment which is very very detailed and that that really tells us what which family should be targeted which families receive universal care so many fam families receive targeted interventions on top of the mandated contacts but within the mandated contacts there is a, a consistent approach to delivering um, the key public health messages in every contact and that would include all the things you've just said, Councillor Mann. So that, that as a routine, those things would be included in the mandated contacts. Of course, if a family needs extra contacts at all, then they, then they may be included in that pathway of care. So there may be specifics around sleep management, but that, that maybe that that sleep management needs to have a, a specialist programs, maybe four visits, four extra visits. But we would always prepare families on normal, realistic expectations of parenthood. So what's normal development? Because some parents have quite unrealistic expectations around crying babies. You'll hear the expression, is she good? You know, is he good? Well, actually, you know, it's not it's not about being good. Babies cry, babies wake up. That is normal. Um, so it is it's about um, really preparing parents for normal, the normal expectations of parenthood. OK, thanks very much. Thank you, Suzanne. I, I can see hands up from Heather, Councillor Mohas and Victoria. Um, maybe their legacy, maybe they're, they're remaining up from. Yeah, OK. Uh, did you want to comment, Victoria? And then I think yeah. we should go. Yeah, I just want to add to what um, Susan just said that yes. health visitors also work very closely with early health services within within the council, with LEAs, child minders, children centres. So again, just re-emphasising that it's an integrated approach, and that uh, professionals work quite closely together to meet the needs of young of, of children and young people. So uh, what the health visitors do complement what the early help and early years services within the council do. So it's a, it's a system wide approach to address these needs. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. Right. I'm going to draw this now to uh, close. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of points, really. We, as John Mann pointed out, we've, we, we were faced with a a uh, grant reduction of, I think, 8% was said. And um, I have I take from the papers that we're, we, we were provided with that um, there's a, a rationale of prioritising the 0 to 5 year olds and, um, and, and vulnerable families. And I haven't heard anything from our discussion which would um, suggest that we're not, we don't think that's the right way forward. I certainly, for one, do think it's the right way forward. And the other, the other main major theme is the increased use of online and remote. And again, I think if that's used sensibly and sensitively, that's that's definitely a, a way forward. So I I think we can um, we we can we can make those those comments. I think they align fairly closely with the comments which I've seen from one or two of the 
area constituency committees. So I think there is a developing consensus here. Now the, the report is going to the executive um, in, in early in the new year. I, I wonder if it might be possible for us, and this is a question really to Louise, I suppose, to uh, do the consultation analysis and, and comment as part of that report in the new year. Yes, I mean, Victoria will confirm we will be including what we've learned from the consultation in the report. So members are in full uh, receipt of all of the information that we've got and we will do an analysis on that. Um, and we're having quite a good response so far, given the circumstances we find ourselves in to the consultation, which is pleasing. Yes, it can't be easy during COVID to do a, a standard form consultation. OK, thank you very much then. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just finish by saying thank you to Louise, to to Victoria and to, to Suzanne for your contributions to the meeting today, which have been really, really helpful. And, and Thank interesting. you. Thank you. Bye bye now. Bye. Thank you. Okay, now that potentially leads us on, indeed does lead us on to item seven, and um, which is uh, the mental health item, quite a, a chunky one. And then we've got a verbal update on the pandemic. Uh, sorry, the, we've got the NHS pandemic recovery planning and the, um, the North Yorkshire perspective on that. I think probably we it might we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes. Um, I, we always knew it was going to be quite a long one, but I'd, I'd like to suggest that we have a five minute break and then uh, start uh, re really, really go at it with the mental health item. Is that OK? Can we say 11.45, we will resume. OK, I'm seeing I'm seeing plenty of thumbs up to that. So see you in five minutes.
Welcome back to this meeting of the North Yorkshire County Council Scrutiny of Health Committee after our brief break. We're turning now to item seven on our agenda, developments in community and inpatient mental health services. Um, we have um, papers, five papers in all, from our colleagues in um, TSESC and Weir Valley's NHS Foundation Trust. And um, I'm handing over at this point to uh, them to to briefly introduce um, the papers, the, the collection of papers rather than the papers individually, and we will then move on to committee questions. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Chair. So if I could just start um, and give you an introduction really to the paper that is around the Hambleton and Richmondshire transformation. This was a paper that we'd originally intended to bring back to the committee much earlier in the year, but obviously due to obvious circumstances with COVID that was significantly delayed and that was an opportunity really to look at the full first year impact from that transformation where wards 14 and 15 in Friaridge were closed and plans were put in place to increase <coughs> and enhance the community teams and also to develop inpatient pathways towards the north to West Park Hospital, Auckland Park Hospital and Rosebury Park. So the paper really provides an update on progress around that and in particular in relation to the data. So a stated aim and objective of the transformation was to reduce lengths of stay and admission, working on the principle that had been established through the engagement that more people wanted to be cared for at home wherever possible. And we were looking at developing services to, to do that. Um, the data provided in the report does uh, demonstrate a positive impact, certainly from the baseline data in 2016 and 17, um, in comparison to the full year of 2019-20. Um, there is some part year data in there in relation to 2021. However, we don't, I think, truly understand the impact of COVID on that data as yet um, as a result of cohorting plans um, and admissions, obviously pathways um, needed to change about how we managed our inpatient estate. So there has it hasn't worked in um, quite the way that we would have imagined. Um, and I'm sure that's true of many um, inpatient wards in mental health. The paper also talks about the changes to team stru structure and some training I developments to improve the skills um, within the teams. And it also early um, highlights areas for further work, particularly around extending the hours of operation in adult mental health and um, doing more work with primary care partners to look at um, developing multidisciplinary team meetings and that would be across adult mental health and older people services. In relation to the other papers, um, we have a paper that provides um, an update following the relocation of inpatient services from the Briary Wing. That paper does highlight that we brought that forward very slightly in relation to COVID to free capacity for Harrogate to um, extend their inpatient facilities as well. And that links very closely to the paper in relation to Foss Park um, that describes its development and also um, how we've um, managed that opening uh, during COVID and how the wards are um, designated really. We've also got a report that speaks to the development of the community hub in North Allerton, which is on target and on um, still on plan to open um, in early well early summer, uh, late spring in 2021, um, and also provides an update on our attempts to establish a hub in the Selby area. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, Naomi. That was a, that was a helpful kind of overview of what we've got to, in front of us. Um, so, um, we, we've got the papers presented in a, in a particular sequence in our pack for today, so it may not be quite the order in which you presented, although I can see entirely why, why you chose to do it in that order, it made a lot of sense. <laughs> so I'm just going to take them in the order that we've, we've got them in our, in our paper pack. And um, so first, first of all, we've got the paper describing the, 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 the um, a slightly prolonged struggle to get a, a community mental health yeah. hub for, for Selby. And um, I wonder if anybody would like to um, question on that. I see somebody's got uh, their hand up. C Councillor Pearson, not surprisingly, from, from the Selby end of the county. Chris, would you like to uh, would you like to kick off on this one? 
Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for that. I would like to ask uh, what is the matter with Wolsey Court? It is in the ownership of the National Health at the moment. It was used as a, a mental health facility some time ago. It's a fairly new building and I'm sure it can be adapted for um, um, children's services within the Selby area. So um, it's next to the hospital, which is ideal. It's plenty of parking space. Um, I can see no difficulty with the use of Woolsey Court. Mm -hmm. Okay, you thank you, to... Councillor. I'll hand you to Martin to respond to that. <laughs> Hi, Councillor Pearson. I, I, I think we've talked about Worsley Court a number of times at Scrutiny Committee, and I think that's something that you've raised with us a couple of times previously, and I think we fully understand you asking that question. We have been unable in nearly three years of searching to find an alternative venue. The problem with Worsley Court originally was it is owned by NHS Property Services and as such that gave us significant limitations on what we could do to the building to make it fit for purposes. It's about 30 years old roughly. Um, however, not being able to find a new site for a hub has meant we've had to change our thinking and we are currently looking to develop Worsley Court um, <clears throat> in, the, in the interim to better accommodate the adult and older persons community mental health teams that are currently based there. We can breathe a bit of extra space for them. Um, the learning disabilities team, which in Selby is a very small team as an adjunct of the York learning disabilities community team is based at the hospital next door but we gather that the service level agreements for that shared space is coming to an end and so we need to make some space for them at Worsley Court as well we have a plan for that and the children's services based at the cabins I think all of us would agree that that's totally unacceptable and has been for a long time the CQC very much held that view in their more recent visit and in January, we're going to start work at, well, we start the work up um, in Worsley Court to accommodate the um, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services into Worsley by summer. Now, we think it will be sort of early summer. The architects have had a look around. Paul and his team have done um, the sort of parameters of the design work. There's a capital budget put aside for the work. Um, so all being well, with a successful tender process at the start of the new year, we should have the space that is not currently used. It's currently empty, although we lease it, um, designated for the children's mental health services. So I think we, we would agree with you that in the absence of anything else, Worsley makes a workable base and we can get all speciality, all specialties into it. So people working across learning disabilities, kids, adults, olders, can at least share information and create more of a seamless service. It wouldn't have been our first choice as a base simply because the ownership issue is quite hard for us and the limitations. However, we've searched long and hard. We've come up, we've come up with nothing and it makes the most workable solution for now. Anything you'd want to add to that, Paul? Yeah, I think probably the only thing that's also not helped in terms of has been able to accelerate that work is working again with local GPs. Some of the space that we'd originally earmarked has been used as a COVID safe space for GPs to operate from. So again, trying to play our part in the the sort of the greater delivery of healthcare on that. Now, we had a meeting with them recently. They can manage, which has allowed the space to be freed up. So as I say, as Martin said, we've now got a plan to deliver something that will get us out of the cabins quickly. We are in discussions with NHS Property Services to look to see whether a better financial deal can be agreed between the two organisations in terms of looking at the opportunity to transfer that property to the trust to give it a longer term future. Thank you. Councillor Pearson, uh, do, do you have any further question on that? Chris, have you got a follow up? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I had trouble putting my mic back on. Right. I'm glad it's been used as a COVID-free space, but uh, 
ask who holds the lease on it. Is it NHS Property Services? And if it's an if it's an NS, NHS property and we're using it for uh, mental services for the NHS, I can see no problem with that at all. It, it without getting into too many tech technicalities about it, NHS property services are a standalone from the NHS in terms of their legal setup, but we are engaging with them. <clears throat> they do own the building, it's transferred into their ownership, but we are looking at ways to see if we can get it transferred into us that isn't to the detriment of sort of financial resource into the Selby area. So we're working hard to get a, a resolution to that. Thanks very much. Any other questions on the on the Selby? Uh, I think forms? this would be a better solution. Yeah. Ah, th thank. Sorry, Chris. I didn't mean to cut across you. Um, any other questions on the Selby paper? No. Okay. In which case, let's move on to the um, the hub at North Allerton. And I must say, this this has been to all intents and purposes, a, a success story. I, I saw there was um, some favourable um, press comment uh, in the last few days, so that's that's good. And, um, I uh, wonder, uh, do any anybody with a particular wish to com comment on this? I don't know whether Kevin Hardesty is waving his hand there. He, I think he is. Kevin, would you like to um, comment or question? Just again, thank you, Chairman. Just again, a comment. Very positive. It's a good move, and we're looking forward to this facility being provided in North Allerton. And all credit to you know, the trust for getting on with it. It's it's a good move. It will certainly benefit the community of both Hambleton and Richmondshire. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, Councillor Hardesty. Anybody else want? Uh, that's a positive note. Maybe we should move on. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. We'll take that. Thank you. We'll we'll bank that one. <laughs> okay. Um, I wonder, um, now then, we're, we've got Foss Park Hospital York, and then we've got following that, we've got the relocation of mental health services in Harrogate since the closure of the Briary Wing. I, I, I wonder whether we could maybe just take those together because they are quite quite intimately linked. Um, sure. um, so any, anybody anybody want to raise any any points on, on that? Um, I see a hand raised somewhere. Who is it? Councillor so Mann. Councillor Mann and Councillor Collingham. Apologies if I've got the order not quite right. Councillor oh. Mann. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, my question is in relation relation to the uh, uh, relocation of mental health services in Harrogate since the closure uh, of the Briary Wing at uh, Harrogate Hospital. As we know, and as we I think heard earlier in the meeting, uh, when the decision was taken about 18 months ago to close the Briary Wing and move inpatient mental health services to York, uh, it seemed to mark the end of a long and intensely political debate about the future of adult mental health inpatient facilities in the Harrogate district. And I think indeed you've mentioned the um, uh, the site that was earmarked for a mental health hospital in the west of Harrogate, which for various reasons didn't uh, didn't go ahead. So I think people in Harrogate now have accepted the the logic of um, uh, the closure of the Briary Wing, um, certainly my residents in central Harrogate, I think, have. Uh, and the transfer of services to Foss Park, which, as we know, is brand new, is a super facility um, in York. Um, but my question was, just in relation to the number of beds available at that brand new facility for, um, for Harrogate people. In the past, there's been a little bit of uh, opaqueness about the number of beds available at the new facility to uh, Harrogate residents. And I just wondered if um, uh, officers present could provide any clarity uh, for the meeting as to how many beds are available, please. Yep. Do you want me to? Or do you want to, Naomi? Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> do apologise. OK. So in terms of Foss Park overall, we've got... Um, sorry, wrong paper. We've got 72 beds in Foss Park Hospital um, and all of those beds are open to Harrogate residents. We don't have a dedicated quota for any locality to be able to use those beds um, because for obvious reasons that could disadvantage and there, you know, there will be um, 
different patient flows from different areas at different times. So we use that as, as a locality resource rather than a specific, we don't have a Harrogate bed and a York bed, for example. In terms of adult mental health, um, overall, um, closing Harrogate and moving to Foss Park had a net loss of two adult mental health beds. And to offset that, we opened two additional beds in Cross Lane in Scarborough. So overall, the provision in the North Yorkshire and York locality for adult mental health beds, the number of beds available across the locality has remained the same um, that we had in Briary Wing previously. Hmm. It's okay. probably well. It was no, that's very helpful. Thank, thanks for the thanks for the answer. Right. Thank you. Okay, I've got um, Councillor Colling and Councillor Moorhouse wanting to ask questions, so I'll take them that order. Um, little bit tongue-in-cheek because it's not often that Scarborough has a provision of services that the rest of North Yorkshire doesn't have so it's great to see that the rest of the county may well be catching up with us. First question really was um, I, as I understand from the paper you've not needed to use those two additional beds in Cross Lane and there has always been capacity in, in Foss Park Do you, and, and, and I appreciate Covid may play into that do you do we have a feeling for if we're 72 is the right number of beds in Foss Park and will you need to do cross lane? Um, I saw in the paper, Martin, that you said it's not an artist impression and I can see it clearly behind <laughs> you um, on your backdrop. It looks fabulous. Um, back to COVID. I would love a site visit when you can. You are able to invite us, please. And thank you. Regards okay. the, regards the site it, visits. So. Yeah, yeah if I start own, on the on the beds in Scarborough and Cross Lane, we have utilised those two beds in Cross Lane, but um, I suppose one of our challenges is that since opening of Foss Park, we've been in the COVID world rather than the the, the pre-COVID. So um, to manage cohorting, to be able to create hot and cold areas, we had to use our wards in a slightly different way. So we do use them. I um, we haven't overachieved uh, or overused our bed occupancy in Foss Park. And there's some figures in the paper as well about older people's beds. I think one of the biggest concerns was around if whether older people with organic needs and dementias would be disadvantaged. And certainly the new ward in Foss Park in uh, Walled View hasn't exceeded 60% bed occupancy since we started. So we are looking at different ways of working. I think the other, um, issue that we will need to um, cover it now and in the coming months is the impact that COVID has had on uh, mental health in the community. I think a lot of our clinical colleagues would agree that we've seen a much higher incidence of um, acute distress and unusually more people being admitted to us first time who haven't been seen before by any mental health services. So the patterns of activity we're seeing this year are, are very different, I think, to, to what we've seen before. And we do expect that to continue the forecasting that we've done around COVID and its impact um, over the next five years. Thank you, Naomi. Um, Councillor Mohas? Did, yes, did thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just going to the northern part of the region, it was in the presentation in the in the presentation. I mean, obviously, I don't I keep going banging on about this, but Rosebury Park has been a bit of a nightmare, I think, for um, for trying to get everything back to where it should be. It had some hiccups and obviously looking at the figures, you know, some of the patients have to go to Darlington. Um, have you any updates on Rosebury Park? Because this thing is I know with some structural problems and it's going to be fantastic and I'm not even sure how many patients from North Hamilton go that way or whether they're going to go back towards the Fry Ridge and obviously patients going to Darlington and wherever Bishop Auckland isn't ideal and, and I appreciate it's a short-term thing what's happening at Rosebury Park I know a lot of members here won't have a clue where that is but it's attached almost to, to James Cook Hospital and you know I appreciate any feedback on that please thank you OK, so before I hand you to Paul Foxton, who will give, be able to give the detail on Rosebury Park itself, I think it's worth clarifying that the pathways, inpatient pathways for residents from Hambleton and Richmondshire do include West Park Hospital in Darlington alongside Rosebury Park Hospital and Auckland Park for organic patients and um, 
the development of the service was to minimise the amount of admissions for those people to, and to keep them at home for longer. So mm. that is a, a, a an agreed pathway, if you like, for those people. We know that there has been an impact um, for patients from uh, who may have um, gone to Rosebury Park, as was originally intended. Mm. I think the figures in the, the document, that the, the bigger document around Hamilton and Richmond should do show that um, we have the majority of patients, if they couldn't access um, what was considered to be their home ward and that pathway, have been managed within North Yorkshire and York as a majority rather than going to other units with um, north, really, of, of the county. Um, but I'll hand you over to Paul for the detail on Rosebury Park. You're on mute, Paul, sorry. Oh. Well, apologies for that. Um, <laughs> I'll have to be quite constrained in what I can tell you because of obviously the pending legal case that we've got. Um, Rosebury Park has a number of blocks. Um, at the moment, we are working on block five, which was where the older people services were based, and they've been transferred to Sandwell Park in Hartlepool for the duration of while the works are being carried out. Our current estimate of block five being completed is actually early May next year. And that is quite a bit beyond the original time frame, simply because unfortunately we have found even more significant defects while we've been doing the rectification works as we're calling it. In parallel to that, we're also doing uh, block 10, which is a forensic block, which is a different category of patient. And we are building a decamp block, which will be completed in January to allow us to move some of the forensic patients around. To give you an idea of our overall completion of the programme, it will be fully complete working on effectively is what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine blocks that need to be rectified. It takes us actually till around about the end of 2025 because of the way we have to keep patient bed numbers up. That said, the older people's element will be completed by May next year that will allow us to get the services back from Sandwell. And then from that, we'll allow some of the pathways to be opened back up into North Yorkshire, as was the original way the service was set up before we actually found out what the, the extent of these defects were, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I would welcome again, as um, Liz mentioned, if at all possible, we get out of this COVID situation, if we wouldn't mind, or even if it's just a few of us, have a site visit, maybe to the opening or something. Thank you very much now. Thank you. We'll pick that up, Heather. Uh, Councillor Clark, Jim, Jim Clark, I think I see that your hand is up. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I, I have a number of general questions that might be, uh, our visitors might take away and come back to us on a number of these. And can, can I say, I, I welcome the reports that have been uh, produced for, for this meeting. And I have campaigned for many, many years uh, for better mental health services mm -hmm. and were around at the time the, uh, the trust was uh, appointed to the present position. And I, and I think mental health uh, facilities have improved since you took over and it was a great shame you weren't able to uh, to build the uh, new facility at the uh, uh, just on the edge of my my division in 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 Harrogate because that was that would have made a, a massive leap of having involved the police and the private sector and the uh, dementia uh, people. I, I, I have three main questions. Uh, one mm. is the uh, going forward, and and the that when when I first got involved with with mental health, it, it was with mental health uh, for for older people and mainly dementia, which was the biggest area that and, and I attended many meetings on that but now a bigger issue is uh, mental health of young people and I think that has really come up during the period we've had of the last year that mental uh, health of, of, of school children and, and uh, students and, and I just wonder and I think something we may look at 
uh, in the future is what impact that may have. I'd also uh, like your comments, and no doubt you'll be commenting on the integrated care policies that, that are out for discussion at the moment. Now, uh, there are some people, I'm not, I'm not one of them, who who, who think it, it's wrong that our uh, provider of mental health services for most of North Yorkshire, well, you provide mental health services, health services for the whole of North Yorkshire other than uh, Craven, uh, which is in West Yorkshire for, 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 for mental health. And it, I just wondered how you saw the situation or if you have responded to the situation, because if if things go as, as <coughs> to plan, and uh, we've been discussing it in, in, in another area of this meeting, uh, all the commissioning will effectively be deep for North Yorkshire will be done uh, from Hull because we are in Humber Coast and Vale, and no doubt you have a good uh, re relationship with uh, Humber Coast and Vale. But you you must have the same problems because you are providing mental health services from an area an area that we used to get told every meeting we went to. I, I was on the uh, scrutiny joint scrutiny committee for Northumberland and Tees Valley and every, with, with Councillor Moorhouse, who who used to say, you know, <laughs> our integrated care system stretches from uh, the borders of North Yorkshire to the borders of Scotland. And uh, the man running at that time used to say you'd get the same services in Berwick upon Tweed as you as you get in in Hambleton, and as, as I said to him at one of the meetings, I don't think the people of Hambleton are really bothered about what happens. <laughs> but, uh, but, I, but I just wondered how you were reacting to uh, the the legislation that will be coming, uh, going through Parliament next year, and hopefully in 19, uh, sorry, 2022, uh, will, will, will be coming together. And, and another uh, issue, and I don't know if you've considered it, but logic would say that, and it's something I've always, I've been a minority on this, uh, is that we're looking at integration of health services and local government and, and all sorts of other <laughs> things. It, it, it must make sense to integrate mental health service with acute and physical health services because i think you have to to look at, at at the body or the person as one person and it's always been a and that i think that has been the downfall of mental health services unt until now in north yorkshire as i say i do welcome the direction of travel we we've got now but it, but people would go for physical uh conditions and be told oh we would need to refer you to uh, someone who deals with uh, with mental health. I think these are quite fundamental changes uh, that that are coming. But uh, I'd, I'd I'd just like to. You might want to take these away. You might like to respond now. They're, they're major issues. But but can I say I'm I'm encouraged by the progress <laughs> you made. But but I think we're up against an awful lot of. Well, it's not opposition, it's ignorance, because uh, there was somebody told me there was something in a newspaper, I don't know which one it was, or it might have been on social media, uh, that was saying we, we had got over uh, the fact that the Briary unit in North Allerton had, <laughs> had closed. I, I didn't see it myself, but, uh, you know, that that's uh, the way. But I, I would like some response, either now or we could look at it in the future, to the... The issues I've raised, and just on a more interesting one, what's the pre present situation in relation to uh, the site uh, that you were going to be building uh, on at Beckwith Head Road? Is, is that now has that now been given to National Health Property, or is it still with the the trust? And what is likely to happen there? Because I've been approached by some GPs who wanted to build some facilities there, but I, I don't know if that's gone any further. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you, Jim. Could I suggest that we have a, a response on the last point about the, the West Harrogate site? And then um, perhaps you take away the more strategic issues which Jim has raised, in particular in, in the context of the, uh, the changes to the integrated care system. Um, indeed, if, if you felt able to copy to us your organisation's response to that, which I imagine you will be making, I'm sure we'd be very interested to see that and it might, um, it might um, help us understand uh, how you how you see things but on the on the west harrogate site could could you could you quickly give us a, a position on that do you want me to cover that yes please paul yeah it, we are currently in discussions we still own the land and we are in discussions with north yorkshire county council uh they have a business case <laughs> to develop um effectively a, a dementia facility on that site um, <coughs> but we've made them aware as well of the GP interest, which has come mm -hmm. through uh, Lisa Pope from the commissioning group. So we are working towards a potential sale by the end of March 2021, subject to North Yorkshire County Council business case approval, um, and obviously getting the requisite planning from Harrogate Borough Council for effectively a minor change of use on the site. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Right. Um, I don't see any. Oh, yes, there's a. No, thank you. Uh, we've got one more paper to look at, and that's the one that um, Naomi referred to uh, in slightly greater detail at the beginning, the Enhanced Community Mental Health Services. Um, are there any questions on, on that? I'll, I'll maybe just start off by asking about um, working practices. Um, if I've read it correctly, we've got seven day working for services for older people, but six day working for services for mental health services for adults. And I just wonder if the rationale of that difference, if I've correctly understood it, could could be explained, please. OK, th um, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the rationale that under underlines the um, older people's approach is based on the fact that um, we know that older people, particularly um, patients and families with dementia, weekends can be very difficult um, challenging behaviours don't stop at the weekend. Um, and also that we had historically longer lengths of stay for people in hospital than we would have uh, wanted. And we know that that can have a negative impact on people's physical and mental well-being um, to be in hospital for long periods of time. So the intention was to create a seven day service so that there's no interruptions to their care from the community team and also to enable them to be discharged home as soon as that is feasibly possible. But mm. they would also be able to receive that support. In terms of adults, um, if you look at their average length of stay, it is much, much shorter and adult services already have um, 24 hour crisis response which older people services did not. So the community service will be stepping up from five days to six days based on what patient activity there is and what patients and families are telling us. But there's still a service on that seventh day that exists as a, as a support network for them. So I think they're the key differences um, okay. around those services. Are you, are you going to make a f any further attempt to get GP views on, on the new service pattern? <clears throat> I know that it says in the paper that you did it attempt to and of course COVID came along but uh, it is rather rather important. It's very important so that was scheduled from an older people's perspective in May of this year uh, so we will be looking to implement that um, early in the new year. Obviously we know at the moment our primary care colleagues um, are particularly focused on delivering the vaccines and uh, you know I have quite a large agenda already. I think in addition to that, though, what we've done during this year is we started pilots with and we started with Hamilton and Richmondshire primary care practices to establish um, regular multidisciplinary team meetings. Um, we tested it in uh, four practice practices in Hamilton and Richmondshire. We've tested it for 90 days and we're looking to roll that out and sustain that. Following that, we've also replicated that in Scarborough and Rydale. And um, we had started to do the work with Harrogate Primary Care, um, but they've asked us to pause slightly just to allow them to do the planning around mm. the vaccines, and we will mm. pick that up with them in, in the new year. 
We're also developing closer working relationships with our GPs and primary care networks in Selby and looking at different ways of working with them. So it's good to get feedback on the transformation, but I suppose we're moving a step forward to yeah. deliver kind of more integrated ways of working and bridge that gap between primary and secondary care. Yes. And what about the views of service users? Have you have you got have you got that built in? <clears throat> Yeah, so um, the family and friends test is used for staff uh, uh, and for uh, patients and their families who use our services. I think it's fair to say it's been fairly consistent during the COVID period that people's responses have reduced significantly. Um, and that is something we need to consider and look at different ways of getting that experience feedback. Mm -hmm. People have traditionally relied on paper methods and being physically present. And obviously during COVID, we've used different methods to be in touch with people um, and to get their feedback. So that is something we're really focused on going into the new year. OK, right. I don't see any further questions, but last chance. I don't see anybody wishing to come in. So um, could I just finish up really by saying um, <clears throat> I feel quite positive about this. This is I mean, mental health is something um, a number of us feel quite passionately about. Um, it's so often the forgotten service in the health service. But I think we've seen some very positive developments here. Uh, obviously, things to keep an eye on with uh, temporary temporary issues like I, I won't go into it now, but the, the, the relocation of the crisis team from Harrogate to Ripon is something that uh, those of us who are Harrogate based will be wanting to keep an eye that that doesn't turn into a permanent uh, service change. But, um, but generally very positive, I think. Um, uh, there was a request for a, a site visit to Foss Park, and I wonder whether that could be logged, obviously, for when COVID conditions permit. We, we do entirely understand that uh, you're struggling with, um, we're all struggling with COVID at the moment. And in passing, just mention that I'm sure we all understand that um, COVID is going to affect your, uh, your, your work pattern very, very significantly and, and and level of level of demand on your services. I'm sure that's well, well understood, even if you're still begin grappling to understand just what the, what the scale of it will be. So, so thank you very much uh, to, to, to the Naomi Martin and Paul. Um, we will want to hear, I think, um, from you again. Um, I would have thought that perhaps in um, Six or nine months might be the might be the time, but um, maybe that would be something that uh, <clears throat> you could discuss with uh, with Daniel Harry outside outside the meeting. Yeah, so, uh, certainly. Okay. So thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Arsene, and thank you, Paul, for your for your presentation. Just just before, uh, just before we go, I've just put a, yes. a, 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 a an e well a, a website in the chat. Um, PNHS have actually produced a very good film about Foss Park and if people go onto that link and go to the Foss Park page of their site they'll be able to watch that and I think in the absence of I say wetting your appetite for an actual visit that will give actually a very nice representation and a, a few more pictures as well as some drone footage of the site just to give you a flavour of what's there. Thank you Paul. That's very helpful to have that uh, that uh, drawn to our attention. Maybe, maybe we could capture that in the minute so that it's uh, it's not lost in the in the chat, so that we 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 can come back to that. And uh, hopefully, in the fullness of time, we will we will actually see the uh, we we will see the site. And um, I've, I'm seeing in the chat uh, column one one or two people saying that they would very much like to do that. So that's yeah. I think a popular a popular move. Yeah, thank so you. thank you very much. Thank you, okay. Chair. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Right. Um, returning to the agenda, and I uh, uh, apologise for the time, but it has been a lot to discuss. We've we've got Wendy Balmain as, and um, her colleagues have been waiting patiently to tell us about NHS pandemic recovery planning. And uh, this is a kind of standing item for us on the on the on the agenda, and um, it, I think I, fe I fear I fear it is going to be one for uh, for a while. So um, unless there's anything else that needs to be said by way of introduction, um, Daniel, um, unless there's anything else to say, I, I would propose to hand over to to Wendy if she's there to um, to introduce her, her item. 
Thank you, John. And yes, and I'm joined by Vanessa Burns, who's the Di Deputy Director for Acute Services with North Yorkshire CCG. So if you've got any really hard questions, we can ask Vanessa, because I've only just picked up the cover of the acute, because Simon Cox, who I know you've been talking to earlier, has moved much more into the East Coast strategy of the piece of work we're doing there. So I've circulated a, um, a presentation, and I'm just going to run through that, if you don't mind. I wasn't going to share it, Daniel, unless you wanted me to, but I was going to just pick out some key points that I thought it would be useful to highlight. Yes, yeah, so if you could do that on an exception on an exception basis, Wendy, that would be good rather than... Okay, okay, I'll try and do that. Um, Thank you. I think, I think what I'd like to say, just to start, is that actually we've called it an NHS response to COVID-19, but actually this has been a huge system response to COVID-19. We've worked incredibly closely with partners. I was listening to Tees Eskenway Valley Partners there with all of our partners across the system and North Yorkshire County Council in particular to make sure we could commission services and put things in place quite quickly um, so that we could keep people safe as we went through wave one, wave two, and, and as you know, we're, we're likely to head into a wave three. So in the slide set, you've got the governance framework, and it was interesting listening to um, Councillor Clark there speaking about the integration agenda, which I won't dwell on, but I think there is just something around in the presentation on that slide too. Um, there is a very clear governance framework with a system leadership executive. So all of the chief execs from across all the NHS um, organisations in North Yorkshire and York and the two councils who have been working together to make sure we respond in a coordinated way to keeping our communities, our people and our patients as safe as we possibly can do. And actually that group of people are also considering what the implications will be of that integration agenda. So I won't dwell on it, but it's just for you to be aware of that. And John, I think when I joined uh, this conversation a little bit earlier, I heard you talk about there was a new emerging landscape. And I think we were, prior to COVID, we were working with primary care in particular to establish primary care networks to sort of try and make that shift outside from everyone going into a hospital or people going in inappropriately to a hospital to actually having a much more community-based, primary care-based model of care. And in some ways, um, COVID has sort of moved us forward in that because primary care networks and their lead clinical directors have had to step up, if you like, to actually mobilise a new service, whether that's a hot clinic in North Allerton or um, a hot clinic in um, Harrogate, whether that's being much more closely aligned to care homes, but they've certainly done a lot of work and moved forward. I think the challenge now is how we get them focused back on delivering some of those core services, supporting people with long-term conditions, making sure screening programmes are happening, making sure people who have a learning disability are getting their annual health check. And there is a national fund that's been made available and this is being distributed to all um, practices across North Yorkshire, their, their portion of that to make sure that they focus on getting people back in for those routine types of appointments that also serve to identify where some of the risk factors might be. And I think just thinking, just moving, thinking around that community integrated agenda, we had done a lot around that in North Yorkshire before COVID. But again, I think that's accelerated. So I do say quite a bit in the slides around the discharge process that we've established. Five discharge command centres across North Yorkshire, established by North Yorkshire County Council, but working very closely with the NHS in terms of making sure that people get out of hospital quickly that we have designated beds that people can go to should they be COVID positive within a care home place. And actually that we can start to think through and respond to what the implications of long COVID might be for some people and how we support people as they, as they um, try to deal with that. I think just focusing on the acute impact in particular. So um, there is at the moment about of about circa, and this is a circa, um, I would need to go back and thoroughly check the numbers. There's about 2,400 general and acute beds across um, South Tees, York Foundation Trust and Harrogate Trust. And there are about 600 of those that aren't in use at the moment. And that's for very good reasons. That's because the hospitals have had to put in place what we call green um, 
red, green and yellow zones. They're quite simple, really. Red, it, it's a COVID positive zone. Green, if you're COVID free and yellow or amber, if you're suspected of COVID. And that's how, that's meant that we've had to reorganise the hospital estate in a different way. People obviously have to use lots of um, personal protective equipment and that can make an appointment time two or three times longer. Um, and I think staff are only allowed to work in those areas where if they're designated green, um, red, green and yellow. So, so all of those things are slowing down. And obviously it means that we don't have as many beds available to us as we'd like to. But at the same time, there is an absolute focus on recovering services and making sure that we go through everybody who's on a waiting list and we can provide more information about this. So everybody who has been waiting, mm -hmm. and particularly those people who've been waiting for longer than 52 weeks, that they've, they've gone through and all the hospitals have done this, a clinical validation process that prioritises them and the risk that they are at of their um, condition deteriorating and then they we go through, they'll be allocated a phase in terms of how they get the access to their treatment. So you'll have heard the stories in the news about waiting lists and they are, unfortunately, um, they are real. Um, but I think there's a really good process in place to risk assess people and make sure they move through. Sorry, did you want to come in there or no? And then there is something just in there around cancer. And I think the headline messages around cancer are that actually we are back up to the um, levels we were before COVID in terms of um, identifying two week wait referrals. So they are now over 92%. There is um, North Yorkshire, Harrogate and York in particular have been less adversely affected than some of our um, big foundation trusts in, in Hull and other places, for example. So while they have, you know, while that's we shouldn't be complacent about it. There is a lot of work happening through the Humber Coast and Vale Cancer Alliance Board to make mm. sure all of those services are back on track. And um, there's going to be there's there's a piece of work underway at the moment to scope out some new community diagnostic hubs. That that is the the money has been nationally announced for that, but we need to fully understand what we need to do to make that real. And I think also there's an audit that's been taken that's happened in primary care to risk assess everybody who is um, potentially on a referral list and understand, you know, some people have delayed coming forward to primary care for very good reasons. Um, and we need to work through all of those people now to make sure that they're not being delayed in their treatment and that's not adversely affecting their treatment as well. Mm. Um, I'll pause there. I think there are one or two other things in the slide and I want to, I know you wanted an update on vaccination. And I'm also going to provide that, but I'll just pause at yeah. that point and just see if there are any immediate questions, John. OK, thank, thank you, Wendy. Um, well, I've, I've got a couple of um, points I'd like to say. Um, I, th I think the, the, the issue that is raised with me more often than any in relation to the, the current uh, position in the NHS is, is the availability of, of GP appointments. Um, I, I noticed that the present in the presentation, you say that um, they are back to pre-COVID levels with a, a mixture of face-to-face um, -face and digital and so on. And um, but I, I think to some extent that's not the impression that's not the impression that is out there. Um, now I know we've had Sir Simon Stevens urging people to not to hold back from consulting their GP if they feel they should. But I just wonder whether um, the um, more could be done locally to because with the greatest respect to Sir Simon, I, I don't think messages coming out of NHS England necessarily have, have the cut through that a message coming from a, lo a local NHS source would, would have. So so I'm, I'm concerned about primary care, access to primary care um, and whether uh, some of the consultations taking place by um, remote means, um, there must surely be a clinical risk there that um, important so conditions are missed which would be picked up if it was a face-to-face -face consultation so that's one point and then on the hospital side um i noticed you say that some um, waiting lists waiting lists haven't gone up i think you say very much um or um broadly in line with pre pre uh COVID yeah, yeah. but of course that that begs the question of waiting times doesn't it it's I mean, the waiting it's times. not really the waiting list we should be considering so much as the 
experience yeah. of waiting that individual individual patients have. Yeah. So, and, and finally, I'll throw in uh, abusing perhaps my chair's position, but I, I would be grateful if, and maybe it's coming into your sec second part of your presentation, whether you could comment on the Nightingale Hospital for for mm. our our region in Harrogate and what okay. what you might be able to say about plans there. So well, thank you very much. Those three, before I go any, I'll have a stab at answering those three. So, so just to be clear on that, there is never, primary care has never been closed in North Yorkshire. And I do know, because I've picked up through different emails that have come through, that there is anecdotal information out there. And some of it will feel very, very real, able to get the face-to-face -face appointment. And I actually, oops, sorry, my machine is... Around. And I, I actually have got personal experience of that myself with an elderly relative. So I understand that there was a, probably a sense of frustration at times in terms of getting a face to face appointment. And in fact, in the first three months, and that's our sort of financial year. So from March, April, May time, we know that face to face appointments or GP appointments in total actually fell by about 24 percent. And that was pretty much in line with the national figures. We were no different to any other place. And what we also know is that actually face to face did fall in that set in, a, in the same period last year, about 47 percent and the remote um, appointments. So that's not always video. Sometimes that's a telephone call. They went up to 130 percent. So there was a real big shift from people being seen face to face to people being seen. Uh, I've been spoken to on a telephone or through a video. Now, what I can also say to you is that actually the video consultation is still really, and I don't have the exact figure, a relatively small proportion of that, what we would call remote um, consultation. Most of that uh, remote consultation is done by telephone. And when we speak to GPs, they say that video consultation has been useful, but actually it's still a small part of everything that they do. And the way that I like to describe it is that I think it's part of the GP's toolkit, if you like, going forward. In another 10 years, if we're having this conversation, I think we'll all be a lot less scared about video consultation. Look what we're doing today. But at the moment, it's still relatively small scale across North Yorkshire. And I think as, as, the, as we've moved through lockdown, through the different waves, it's much more it's much easier now to have a face to face appointment but that remote triage will stay there for a while because it's there it's there not only to protect the patients it's there to protect the staff so i think we'll see a mixed economy john i think we are but i, I would not want the message to be that um, and i know i've heard this sometimes and we have put some comms out locally through the ccg to combat this that primary care is closed because it certainly isn't and and just to put it in we've got some of the best primary care in the country in North Yorkshire and that's not just me saying that that's through external validation CQC 98% of our primary care practices are, are have a, a standard of good you know assessed as good so yeah. we, we've, we've got a really strong primary care in, in this place I think in terms of the hospital waiting times Vanessa might want to come in on this but my um overview would be so we did say um waiting time waiting lists are about the same as pre-covid but we've all i think i mentioned when i was going through the presentation the 52 week waiters are much greater now than they ever were we never had 52 week waiters in north yorkshire we might have had a handful here and there and we were scrutinized you know rightly so about those but actually like the rest of the country we've got a lot more predominantly they are around orthopedics and what we need to do is we are and we're and actually i've got a meeting immediately after this is we are looking at what other support can we give to people who are on those waiting lists while they whether that's through primary care whether that's through voluntary sector report support um whether that is um you know making sure and i know that they all have been through that validation process so their risk has been assessed but it is difficult. We're also commissioning um, additional capacity through the independent sector. So I know some of those things are still quite commercially sensitive and those contracts are being worked through, but we are looking to, you know, to contract with the independent sector so that we can get some of those waiting lists reduced. So 
I'll pause. I'll just bring in Vanessa there, if you don't mind, just to check if she wants to add anything on the 52 week sure, sure. wages. I know she's closer to it than I am. Thank you, Wendy. Thank yeah, just to add really that indeed there were only, uh, I think, four um, 52 week waiters in January of this year. And obviously that's that's risen quite significantly for reasons that we all understand. It is predominantly in orthopaedics. Um, a, a lot of the orthopaedic patients waiting just aren't of the same clinical priority. So it's really supporting those patients that do need to be seen urgently. And that has resulted in the in the waiting times being pushed out. And as Wendy said, there's there's a huge amount of work um, some already in, in place through through the acute hospital prioritisation and, and safety netting process, but um, other pieces of work being scoped to um, to support patients who are waiting. Right, thank you. OK, I've got a uh, um, from I think from Councillor Middlemass, Nigel Middlemass. Is that right, Nigel? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the question I was going to ask is that uh, in the press recently, it's been suggested that anything up to 40% of people who get COVID uh, do so as a result of being in hospital for some other, some other reason. Uh, and so the question is, firstly, is, is that right? And if it's not, how could we uh, dispel that fear so that people do actually go to hospital for other reasons? So I think I would have to defer to my public health colleagues. Um, if um, I don't know if Louise on the call or whether we've got that information. But that's, <coughs> I, I mean, I'm not a big fan of um, listening to what's reported in the media, alone, unless it's the BBC who seem to get things a lot more quickly than we do. Um, but I don't know that I would, um, I couldn't confirm that, Nigel. We'd have to take that one away unless public health colleagues have anything else to offer. It doesn't feel right that they, that um that that seems a really high figure 40 percent there were it, it, there's no doubt that there is some people who do contract covid um if they are um going into an acute setting but actually there's been a huge amount of rigor put into testing and all acute staff now are tested three times a week through lateral flow testing so the testing should have reduced that so it, it doesn't feel right to me but i couldn't confirm or deny uh, the detail really maybe yeah, that's I mean, something when my, they, my, you could my, my concern nice. in, i was going to say my concern in that respect is it may be stopping people going to hospital for all sorts of other reasons that they might need to and and if it's wrong it would be helpful to know that so that we can tell people that that's wrong and that they should still go to hospital. Well, we certainly are saying that to people. And I think if I just come back to one of the reasons we've got the red, green and yellow sites is that people are, nobody can go to hospital for any reason, at, well, they can if they're an emergency, without having a test 72 hours in advance. And therefore, and if that test is positive, obviously there has to, they're, they're the has to, their treatment has to be delayed or it has to be um, addressed in a different way. So the checks and measures that are in place now around testing would suggest to me that information isn't correct. I mean, if you want to tell me where it's been reported, um, perhaps we can look into it, but I, I haven't seen that reported, so I couldn't comment on it. Could I suggest that that uh, particular discussion is is conducted off, offline? I, I agree it's an important one because it, um, if, it if it were to be... Uh, Good data. It would be it would be a worrying one, and it would serve as a deterrent, as, as I think yeah. Nigel has suggested. So I wonder if maybe Louise that Wallace could be discussion to carry on. Yeah, I wonder if Louise Wallace and I could take that away and just consider where that data is coming from and whether it's reliable. Yeah, it was an article in the it was an article in the Telegraph. Yeah. Was it? Okay. Okay. I okay. Don't know if that reflects to yeah, and my concern in that respect is because the Telegraph is a respected uh, newspaper. If if what they're saying is wrong, then it's quite important that we let people know that that's wrong. Yes. Well, if we can if we can confirm that it's incorrect, then um, there is an obvious way of correcting it in the form of a, a letter to the uh, to the newspaper in, in question. But uh, we, we, I don't think we can uh, bottom the, the, the statistics here, but I, I think it's important that we should do after the meeting. Okay, uh, 
And the nightingale, um, John, you just picked, you asked about the nightingale. Um, yes. And I don't think there's any plans. So there are no plans to use the nightingale at present for any admissions. I think there is a workforce issue across North Yorkshire where it would be, we'd have to take people from other places to open it. And actually there is a, there is a reducing trend in terms of the COVID occupied beds at yeah. the moment. So as of yesterday, there were only 19 people, still 19 people, 19 people across North Yorkshire, um, actually 26 if we include Airedale as well in that, um, yeah. who were in an intensive care bed and we had, including Airedale and Darlington, we had about 220 people in general and acute beds, but that is in, that's a, that's a, a declining trend. Um, and we hope, you know, as uh, if people keep themselves safe, practice all the good public health um, measures that are, are consistently being communicated out to the public. Um, I know there's some worries about Scarborough at the moment, um, but we hope to see that trend continue. Mm -hmm. In which case we wouldn't need to use Nightingale. Yes, yes. Thank you. I, th I think your, your reference to the difficulty that there would be in staffing Nightingale kind of leads me on yeah. to another question to just to acknowledge really that the um, there must be a great deal of fatigue amongst the NHS workforce and because um, it's been it's been nine months now hasn't it pretty much flat out and I just wonder um, how 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 are you coping and is there any way in which we from our our separate position here can can help? I think the the, the probably the best way you could help is you know just acknowledging that it's really nice to hear that the sort of committee recognizes that I think I would say the same for social care staff actually we yeah. are people both frontline and behind the scenes have done a tremendous amount of work and it is it, it is tiring isn't it when it's when it there's no end in sight um hopefully um I think people just feel it's it's too important John that they have to be there and I you know we've had We've had limited outbreaks in primary care workforce, so we've been quite lucky there. There are a number of outbreaks live at the moment in some in York Foundation Trust, but that's being managed and that's about a sort of affects staff as well. Obviously, there's been regular outbreaks across care homes. People, I think, just feel they have, you, you can't leave somebody in a hospital bed or waiting to be seen. You know that you have to go into work, don't you? And I think we've got a fantastic workforce across our NHS and social care and acknowledging that through this committee would be really helpful. I wonder if it's worth me just touching on the vaccination and on that note and where we are, what the current progress is with that, because actually that is one significant sort of um, light at the end of the tunnel for us, really. Yes, that would be a good note on which to, uh, to, to end the item if we can. So we are really restricted, and I did share this with Daniel in what we can say in terms of the national communication around this is incredibly tight. But I think what I can say today is that we have got um, 12 sites that will have gone live across North Yorkshire and York um, by Christmas Eve. Five of those are live today and we'll have another seven going live over the course of this weekend and early next week. And by Christmas Eve, the 24th of December, um, I'm in a bit of denial about Christmas, but I believe it is just around the corner, then um, oh, well. we will we'll have offered about um, circa 13,000, we'll have vaccinated about 13,000 um, of our over 80s population. So that will be their first vaccination and they'll get the second one 21 days later. So these are very small amounts of vaccination that are coming through. And as I'm sure you'll be aware, the vaccination has lots of complexity in relation to its stability and being moved around. It has to be stored at um, minus 70 when it's received into the approved designated sites that we have across North Yorkshire. Then it's stored in a special fridge between <coughs> two and eight degrees and it has to be used within um, three days. So there's a there's a military like operation behind the scenes um, working very closely with our primary care colleagues with LRF colleagues in the council um, to mobilise this response. It's, this, it's, this, it's the beginning of what will be a period of vaccination programme that will last several months and will gain in scale. I think what I can say is that over the last three days, the first sites that have gone live and who two of whom delivered 
um, all of their vaccinations that were made available to them, it's all gone really well. Uh, we've had there's been no adverse effects and we've had a tiny, tiny um, do not attend rate. So actually, we're not wasting any of the vaccine either, which is really important. Mm -hmm. So it feels really positive. Um, of course, people still have to be extremely careful um, over the next um, period. Um, and I think the message is don't contact us, we'll contact you. So, of course, everybody wants to know and ring their GP practice, don't they, to say when, can, when might I get a, um, an appointment for vaccination. But really, we are focusing on those people most vulnerable, high risk, over 80s. Um, they will be contacted and are being contacted to come in for um, an appointment as soon as um, the vaccine's available. Mm -hmm. All right, Wendy, that's, that's a, that is a positive note, very much. And uh, I noticed one of one of our one of our colleagues is, uh, has, is reporting a family member has already had their vaccination. So it is real, it is right. happening. And that's good to know. Any yeah. other questions, anyone? Uh, I think uh, John Mann has got his hand up. John, Councillor Mann. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd just like to, uh, if I may, thank Wendy for a, a reassuring update. Um, we seem to be making good progress, um, especially in Harrogate, I think. I say that because I, uh, I'm a governor at the, the local hospital. And if I may, if I could just reassure any uh, resident who might be listening to this, that Harrogate Hosp Hospital is, is making good progress in recovering from, from lockdown in, and in resuming its services to, I think it was 90%, which um, NHS England were, were asking of it. For example, we were told recently in a briefing uh, just a few days ago that uh, in relation to outpatients for example 70 percent of the planned activity was actually delivered in october with a forecast increase uh, of 86 percent in november we don't yet have the stats for november but i was reassured by that as a local councillor and also in relation to um, inpatients uh, 109 percent of planned activity was delivered in october with a forecast of 95 percent for november so as a local councillor for harrogate i was uh, immensely reassured by that. They seem to be making very good progress in recovering towards their pre-COVID services. Um, and just, just finally, I was told also that uh, by December, the hospital in Harrogate plans to have clinically reviewed patients on the RTT waiting list. As you know, that's the referral to treatment waiting list uh, to ensure that all the patients on that list have have the right priority. So I think it's a, it's a good picture. I'm very I'm pleased to hear the news which Wendy has given us of the bigger picture. I am encouraged. I know that there has been a bit of doom and gloom um, around the place, but I do think the NHS is recovering locally. My question, Chair, if I may, is very brief. As part of the briefing which I received from uh, the Chief Executive, they were saying, uh, as at the 11th of December, Harrogate Hospital had 20 inpatients who were COVID positive. And this position has been broadly static for the last seven days and is only 7% of their bed base. So again, I was encouraged. I think there's light at the end of the tunnel. So only 7% of the bed base is taken up by COVID patients. I just wondered, Wendy, if you could, if you had a feel for the comparable figures for the main acute hospitals elsewhere in, in North Yorkshire, for example, South Tees or Scarborough. That was so my I have got to that. So that figure, um, John, I haven't got the breakdown percentage in front of me where, so I know we've got something like 159 people in a COVID positive bed currently in, that includes Harrogate though, that's Harrogate, South Tees and York. Um, and I also know we've got 19, this was as of yesterday, 19 people across those same three trusts who are in intensive care beds. So I don't have the percentage breakdown, but if you think that um, South Tees has got something like a thousand beds, um, then actually the numbers are quite small. So there is definitely a, a, a decreasing trend um, in terms of um, people going in with a COVID positive um, di uh, test. Mm. I think the thing that we can't be, you know, we've just got to be really cautious about. And again, even though I've sort of don't always uh, follow the media as closely as I could because it's quite often quite dismal. Actually, the, the noises about a third wave are very real mm -hmm. um, and we are all worried about that across the system. Um, and therefore, people do need to do the simple things, you know, washing their hands, covering their face, keeping their two metre distance 
um, to actually help keep themselves safe. And I think just to um, add on, just is, again, if the public are listening to this, and when I said, you know, around vaccination, uh, we will contact you, please don't bring up the practice. But if people are mm. concerned about their health and they have symptoms, they should be ringing their GP practice to make an appointment. Um, and I just wanted to just uh, reinfor reinforce that. Really. Okay, Th thanks very much. Thank you. Any other questions for, uh, for Wendy? Just a moment. No, I don't see any. Um, so, I'll, so Wendy, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, Vanessa as well for, for coming along to, to to update us. It's been really, really helpful. So thank you. Bang up to date, and that that's great. Um, I'm sure we can, um, as a committee, we can we can help um, by uh, promulgating that message about don't contact us in relation to vaccination. We'll we'll contact you. We can certainly um, take that on board as individual councillors and in our network. Thank you. And likewise, the, the NHS primary care is open for business. We can yeah. we can ensure that message goes out as well. So let, let's let's do that. I think I think it's 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 a positive note. So it's good to finish on finish the year on a positive note in relation to vaccination generally. <clears throat> and indeed, some of these specifics that you gave us, like the the very low that did not attend rate, is augurs well. I think as well. And then uh, John John Mann's uh, contributions, the statistics from from Harrogate Hospital mm. seem to be um, seem seem to be positive. So uh, I think that's a, it's a good that's a good note. Um, we're going to be returning to um, NHS pandemic recovery in in uh, is it March, Daniel? At our we we have we will be doing at a, at, a, at our next meeting whether that's February or March. I can't uh, I'm not sure offhand. Um, but I wondered, <clears throat> excuse me, it's for my colleagues really, whether we should um, have a perhaps have a particular focus on this question of um, the the face to face versus remote consultation, um, the opportunities that brings, the risks it brings as well, what it says, what it what it uh, means for capacity in the system. So I think that would, if rather than us having a a, a very broad update every. Time. I think it will be helpful if we can focus in a, a little bit, and that's my starter for ten in that in that regard. Liz Colling, you, you, Councillor Colling, are you wanting to come in? Um, I'd like to agree with you about that, but can I add into that mix, please? Um, the use of the NHS app, so particularly in areas with um, that have a low digital inclusion, I'm interested mm. in in how we can facilitate them using the app. Um, you know, anecdotally, we all get told that there are long, long waits um, to get through on the phone to make an appointment. I understand, and I'm in the process of setting it up for somebody um, that you can do all that on the app. So I think it would be really good to get a broader picture about access routes into primary care. Okay, that's useful addition. I think, Wendy, is that is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that access routes into primary care is really helpful, actually, that steer. Just to say on the face to face, there is a piece of national work happening at the moment around a GP activity data. So we're not rich in data about primary care, but we've, I think that's been recognised. It is held by every individual practice, but of course, every individual practice is just that. You know, it's, yeah. an, it's an independent contractor, which I don't think is always fully understood by no. um, people who use services. So we might, we will come with, um, whenever the next update is, there might be a delay in terms of us getting some of that activity data because it's part of a national programme, but we'll certainly yeah. keep updated mm. where we can. Yes, and, and I think if we can, if the discussion can be a sort of evidence-based one when it comes about um, just what does it mean for um, for, for clinical risks if um, consultations are are not face-to-face, -face, that would be an aspect we'd certainly want to, to include. Thank you. Okay, I think Wendy and uh, and Vanessa, that <coughs> excuse me, that that's uh, that's been a terrific presentation from you. Um, we're very grateful to you for taking time away from what must be a, a really really busy uh, time in the NHS. And um, you said you were in denial about Christmas. I could definitely <laughs> encourage you to to get with the project. <laughs> uh, well, I hope you have mince pies, John. So maybe I need to eat a mince pie. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be a good start, anyway. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Right. Hi, colleagues. Thanks for sticking with us. We're, we're nearly there. Um, we've got a, a very much a linked um, item now, which is uh, Louise um, giving us a public health view on 
the, the latest on the pandemic, because I think as a Food and Health Committee, we, we really should be briefed on um, on what the latest is with the pandemic and uh, implications for the NHS. And it's, it's great that Caroline, uh, as executive member, is here as well. So, Louise, do you have a, a quick <coughs> update for us? Thank you, Chair. I do. And um, I'm sure uh, members look on the Council website and see the data um, that's updated uh, very, very regularly. So you can see the rates in your areas. Um, would it be helpful for me to run through the numbers quickly from the, the most recent data? Because I can certainly do that. I do have it with me. So um, okay. England average today, and this is a seven day rate per 100,000 population, is at 234.6. Scarborough is at 214.2. Selby 131.3, Craven 117.3, North Yorkshire average therefore is 116.3, Richmondshire 111.7, so 111.7, Harrogate 92.6, Rydale 63.2 and Hambledon 61.1. So you'll see in that that when we get our North Yorkshire rate it is an average of, uh, it, it's a a culmination, if you like, of all of our different rates across each of our geographies. Um, what I was saying uh, earlier in the week is that we'd seen that kind of plateauing. We'd seen the numbers clearly come down from the peak in mid-November and we began to see a bit of a plateau. Um, you'll see in some of the media that we're starting to just really push the message about Scarborough because that rate is quite high. Whilst it is beneath the England average, it is still higher than I'd like it to be heading into Christmas. So, Members, we are increasing activity through our locality work, making sure that the comms is there, making sure that we've got compliance with support from our district council colleagues in terms of local businesses, trying to get out there into communities. But I just would urge everybody at this time just to try and do everything we possibly can to get the message <coughs> out there, particularly as we head into Christmas, making sure people do stick to the orderly three households mixing over that five day period. Um, obviously, the more contact we have with people, the more risk we put ourselves at and making sure that we just follow the basics around good hand hygiene, ventilation, social distance and wearing face coverings. I know I'm speaking to a committee who are fully um, aware of all of this, but I really just want to stress those messages over the next few uh, days heading into Christmas to make sure we get those rates as low as possible. And of course, hope to not have um, an increase in cases in the new year, but that will absolutely depend upon how much we mix and how much... Um, spread they will be over the Christmas period um, so I'm really passionate about this right now as you can tell just need to get those rates down just need to keep them down and keep people safe yeah. um, that's it before I keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I could just comment that the the messaging we've had from uh, from Richard Flinton and and from up to now Lincoln uh, providing those weekly or is it sometimes twice weekly updates has been really helpful and um, I know it's um, it's data that's trusted out there. People people do act on it and believe it. So keep it coming, please. Absolutely, and thank you uh, for the support that you'll you'll give to us in public health in that because it is um, a really crucial time, isn't it? And particularly in the middle of the winter. So thank you for yeah. your support. Okay, thank you. Is there anything you wanted to add, Caroline, as from your perspective? Just my usual mantra, mantra, hands, face, space. It's one of those things we've got to take responsibility for, for our own actions and those people around us. Because, you know, we, we see things level off and then it's all oh, right, let's have a Christmas party and we're, hey, yeah. we're, they're, they're heading yeah. up again. So we do have to really take that responsibility seriously. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's a grown up, it's a grown up message. Take responsibility, isn't it? <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much. I think uh, we can we can leave that there. And that just leaves us <coughs> really with um, the work programme. Uh, Daniel, is there anything particular you want to uh, mention in that connection? No, there's nothing. Um, uh, obviously, members have seen the work programme has been circulated with the published papers. Um, as ever, I would encourage members to review it. Um, and raise any items that they think do need to be put on the work program with me so I can do a bit of follow up on it and then uh, share with the chair and vice chair. Um, but beyond that, I wouldn't suggest going through it now, councillor in view of uh, chairman in view of the time. No, indeed, no, it's, not, it's not the time for doing that. Could I just mention that dentistry has been, uh, one or two people have recently raised that, and indeed a question was asked at full council in um, 
last month. And uh, I think personally that that would be a good one for us to uh, to to bring forward at, 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 at a future meeting. OK, Any, anything else from anybody before we um, before we depart to our uh, our um, it's not quite Christmas holidays because I think there's, a, there's at least one more uh, official county meeting next week. Uh, COVID outbreak management board, isn't it? It is, but, yes, the uh, outbreak management board next week. So yeah, yeah. But as far as scrutiny of health concerned, that's the end of the year, the year's meeting. So can I thank you all very, very much indeed and uh, wish you all a happy and healthy Christmas and uh, look forward to seeing you all in, in the new year.